This story happened to a young man named Jusu. After graduating 12th grade, he passed the entrance exam to a university in the city. Living in an unfamiliar place was extremely difficult, but it only took Jusu a few days to settle in. He even made friends with two boys in his dorm and was about to have his first college trip. The trip's location was not far away. In fact, it was just a hill next to the school. As planned, they would camp overnight on the hill. The air on the hill was really fresh. Although the hike up the hill was a bit rough, no one felt tired. However, things were not going smoothly. After walking for a while, they started to get lost. Eventually, they found a small path covered with trees. It looked very murky and mysterious. At the end of the small path lay a cold and lonely grave in the woods. Jusu was basically a child without fear. Seeing that, he invited two of his friends to come for a closer look. At first glance, it definitely looked like a tomb. But the shape of the tomb was really strange. The other two boys only stood there for a few minutes, then left. But Jusu still lingered, standing there, staring at the tomb. But strangely enough, the more he looked, the more he felt some kind of magical energy. This energy completely engrossed him. Then, his friend came over, shook his shoulder and called his name, loudly. Jusu suddenly woke up, but Jusu's face was still pale and his limbs soft. He was sweating like a waterfall. Not only Jusu's face, but also his friend's faces had deteriorated, as if they had just seen something terrifying. The picnic must stop. But from that day on, strange things kept happening to dorm room 310. The first thing that happened was with Jusu's slippers. He has a habit of neatly arranging his slippers under the bed when he sleeps. But since that night, he was waking up to his slippers dispersed all around his room. Days later, the slippers were still being rearranged all over his dorm. So Jusu decided to talk to his roommates. But their expressions were very strange. One afternoon, Jusu suddenly saw all his roommates packing up, as if they wanted to leave. He thought they must be angry about the trivial matter a few days before, and that they decided to move. But looking at their facial expressions, Jusu could tell it was for other reasons. Then, someone new moved in, and his old roommates left overnight. But Jusu stayed because he really didn't believe in ghost stories. Until one night. On a normal evening, while reading a book, Jusu fell asleep and was woken up by the dorm's bell. But he just closed his eyes, ignoring it. Five hours passed and it was dinner time. At dinner, the dorm manager didn't see him come down. She was afraid that something was wrong. She ran upstairs to call him. Not believing his eyes, he looked at his watch again. But it was still five o'clock. His watch had stopped working. Even though he panicked a little, Jusu tried to reassure himself that he had just fallen asleep while reading the book. After dinner, Jusu decided to finish reading the book before going to bed. But with only a few lines, he could barely hold his eyes open. His body really couldn't resist sleep. Then he put the book aside, turned off the light and went to bed. Suddenly, he woke up at 4am in a panic as if he had just had a nightmare. Not only that, he had also found himself wearing proper clothes. But from what he remembers, he wore an old t-shirt to bed yesterday. His feet even wore oh. shoes. And the shoes were covered with dirt and mud. As if he had been walking around for a long time. 
The shoes made his bed muddy. But Jusu really couldn't remember where he went yesterday. He just remembered turning off the lights and going to bed. On the sole of his muddy shoes, there was still fresh grass. So he could tell that he definitely went outside. In order to clarify what happened to him, Jusu decided to find his best friend Ken, who lived in the same dorm before. After school, Jusu secretly followed Ken to the garage. Looking around, seeing no one, Jusu immediately approached his best friend. Then, he suddenly grabbed his neck and pulled him into a hidden corner in the garage. As soon as he saw Jusu, Ken panicked, as if seeing a ghost. Blood drained from his face. After being released by Jusu and knowing the reason for his actions, Ken was able to calm down, but his hands and feet were still shaking. Of course, Ken firmly refused to answer Jusu's questions, only asking him to let go. Seeing that, Jusu began to soften his voice, saying that he really wanted to know what happened after they returned from their picnic. Seeing Jusu's facial expression, Ken started to feel pity. He lowered his face and thought for a long time. Observing Ken's body language, Jusu could tell that something bad had happened to him. Ever since coming to the city, he considered Ken his best friend. But now, when he was in trouble, the only thing Ken was doing was avoiding him. Immediately, his anger erupted. Jusu could no longer keep calm. He grabbed Ken by the collar. Facing Jusu's anger, Ken gave in and finally accepted to speak the truth. It turned out that the strange things started happening after Jusu stood in front of the grave on the school trip. Ken told Jusu that he looked like he was possessed by a ghost. His eyes rolled back and his whole face was pale and mouth grinning wide. He told him that he also started waving his hands and feet and was singing like a crazy man. Ken went on to say that after that day, when the clock hit 12 o'clock, he got out of bed and would sleepwalk around the dorm. Ken said that every night was like that, and that Jusu kept pacing back and forth in the bathroom. He said that he kept banging his head against the wall, and his mouth muttering something terrifying. Seeing Jusu's unusual behavior, Ken said that all the friends in the dorm were sure he was haunted and then everyone chose to leave for peace. Hearing this, Jusu couldn't control his emotions, giving Ken a strong fist to the face. After that, he left Ken sitting on the ground. Jusu then called his father to tell him everything and got scolded by him. It seemed he knew how scary the tomb was. His face blacked out, and with a cold voice, he began to talk about the unknown tomb. Two days later, after receiving the call, the father immediately set off and went to the dormitory where his son was staying. As soon as he arrived, Jusu's father asked to take him to the unknown tomb. Jusu also didn't say anything more. He immediately led his father to the hill next to the school. Jusu's father looked at the anonymous tomb for a long time. His face looked very serious. Then. He sat on the ground and opened the wooden chest he had brought along. It turned out that inside was copper brass. Then he used this copper brass to burn pieces of votive paper. Soon after, Jusu's father stood up. His mouth began to murmur as if he was reciting a spell. Strangely, as soon as his words ended, the copper brass trembled in a frightening way. Then. The fire in the brass was burning louder and louder, like someone added oil to it. At that same time, the father's face became more serious. It seemed that their request made the soul angry. In that moment, Jusu was clearly terrified, thinking that he could be haunted for the rest of his life. The father was also a bit panicked, but still tried to stay calm to reassure him. He put his hand on Juicy's shoulder, 
saying that he would try to ask again. This time, Juju's father prayed more sincerely. He bent down, clasped his hands respectfully. When the father finished his plead, the fire in the brass immediately shrank. It seemed that the spirit had accepted his appeal. No hurry to leave, after finishing everything, Jusu and his father still lingered to burn the remaining holy paper. Then, they tidied up the ashes, cleaned the tomb, and left. Perhaps Jusu would never forget the horror that happened to him on this strange grave. Afterwards, he also realized how much his father worried about him. Although his face was always calm, his shirt was already drenched in sweat on his back. He also realized that his father's profession was not as bad as he always thought it to be. Although he did not show it much, he really loved his son so much. A few days later, Jusu's life began to settle down again. Perhaps this is why our grandparents often told us not to stay at the grave of the deceased. When the night fell, we once again sat down in a circle to hear the wonderful stories being told by my grandmother. That night, my grandma told us a scary story of a sea monster that loved to eat children. Needless to say, all of us were terrified yet curious at the same time. We asked her about its appearance, what the monster looked like, was it long or short, or did it have many sharp teeth? Seeing us speaking chaotically, my grandmother told us to stay quiet and stop interrupting her mid-sentence, or else she would not tell us the story. We then told her that we would remain silent and not ask anything. Under the dim light, Grandma started narrating the story. It had happened 20 years ago, back in the day when misogyny was still a thing as people had strong prejudice towards women. Out of curiosity, I asked my grandmother what misogyny was. She explained that it was the hatred for women or girls, as people had a tendency to respect men while disdaining women. My grandma raised a needle to my face, saying that she would sew my mouth up if I continued to interrupt her, then moved on with her story. That day Mr. Kang's daughter-in-law had just given birth to a baby, however he wasn't happy with it as he looked worried. The man had been thinking a lot as his son and daughter-in-law were still struggling to have a baby after 10 years and the fact that it was a baby girl made him feel truly upset. Thinking about the neighbors laughing at this new family when they found out about his new grandchild, the man felt even more disappointed. But anyway, he had to go check on his newborn grandchild. Having mixed feelings, Mr. Kang blankly gazed at the baby lying neatly in the arms of his son Ken, but the look on his face started changing as he smiled cheerfully. Turned out it was the adorableness of the baby that put a smile on him. Even though she was crying, yet she still looked as beautiful as an angel. Ever since that moment, Mr. Kang had a sudden change in his thoughts. He was no longer bothered about his grandchild being a boy or a girl. As he carried the baby in his arms, his eyes were filled with happiness as he named her Tani. As time went by, the baby had now become a little girl who was able to run and sing. One afternoon, as Mr. Kang was taking a stroll with his granddaughter, he bumped into an old friend of his who was also being with his grandchild. The man instantly bragged about his grandson as soon as he saw Mr. Kang. He later made some rude remarks about Tani. Is this little girl your granddaughter? <laughs> she looks lovely, but such a shame that she's not a boy. <laughs> Mr. Kang was extremely annoyed by those ironic words from his friend. 
It wasn't the first time for Mr. Kang to deal with such unkind words as he constantly heard people in the village saying bad things about his family. As Mr. Kang took his grandchild to go fishing, they encountered a group of people who were terribly rude to them. If I were Mr. Kang, I would definitely strangle that little girl to death right the moment she was born, since I couldn't stand being humiliated. <laughs> the guy then bursted out laughing. Everyone knew that he was just making a joke, yet it made one feel extremely uncomfortable to hear it. Of course, Mr. Kang didn't care about those nasty words as the two kept going to the fishing spot. However, as the night had already fallen, yet the two hadn't returned. Mr. Kang's wife and son hurriedly went to the riverbank, searching for them. But there was just a hook, an empty bucket and a fish spotted at the scene, while Mr. Kang and Tani were nowhere to be seen. The two called out their names loudly, but received no reply. A while later, the couple saw a figure appearing in the middle of the river. It seemed like Ken's mom had figured out who it was. She immediately panicked. Ken quickly ran to the spot as he got closer. He gradually understood what was happening. Turned out that the one in the river was Mr. Kang. Ken and his mother quickly asked him about Tani. But Mr. Kang just remained silent to their question as he lifelessly looked at them, then slowly dived into the water. Feeling worried, Ken told his mom that he would jump into the river and save his dad or else Mr. Kang would die from exhaustion. Ken quickly swam to his father. As the two finally swam ashore, he asked his dad what had happened. Filled with horror, Mr. Kang breathed shallowly as he told his son that Tani had been caught by a sea monster. Ken's face instantly changed color. Shortly after that, Mr. Kang's wife asked the villagers to help them find Tani, but their efforts were in vain. Many of the villagers believed that Mr. Kang had brutally killed Tani due to his strong dislike for her, but the family members refused to go with it. However, they still wanted to find out the truth. Mr. Kang stayed quiet for a while, then recounted the tragic incident to them. He and Tani were fishing at the riverbank. As Mr. Kang had been sitting for a long stretch of time, his legs were all numb and tingled. He got up, intending to walk around for a little. Of course, the man didn't forget to caution his granddaughter not to go into the water. Then he turned around and performed some exercises to relax his body. All of a sudden, a loud noise from behind startled him instantly. As he turned around, he saw the water surface slowly rose as it gradually formed the huge mouth in the middle. As Mr. Kang was still in bewilderment, he immediately got shocked to see his grandchild Tani being swallowed into the river. The man screamed loudly, but it was too late. Without hesitation, Mr. Kang quickly jumped into the water looking for his grandchild in panic. He desperately searched for her, but his efforts were in vain. The disappearance of Tani made him feel extremely guilty as he believed it was entirely his fault for not protecting her. The man also added that the sea monster had returned as it went to the river through an estuary. Being struck with grief, Mr. Kang's hair turned grey quickly. It's not to say that he had to come under bitter criticism from the villagers as they believed he was the one that killed the little girl. As time went by, one day, his eye suddenly alighted a ray of hope. Unexpectedly, Mr. Kang got out of his house, something that he hadn't been doing for days. He even bought a coil of rope and some iron bars. As the man returned, he instantly went to the warehouse and locked the door tightly. From inside the warehouse, noises of materials clanging on the sound of hands sawing were audibly heard. His wife was really worried about him as she brought meals to her husband daily, yet the man didn't eat even just a bit. Every afternoon she stood by the warehouse door crying, yet Mr. Kang never came out to see her. It was until the fourth day that the door was finally opened. Mr. Kang slowly walked out of the warehouse. Shortly after that he assured everyone that he would go to the river and catch the sea monster at all costs. 
It turned out that for the last few days the man had been making a big hook in order to take his revenge on the monster that killed his beloved granddaughter. His wife instantly stopped him as it was too dangerous, but no matter how hard she tried to do it, Mr. Kang still ignored her and stick to his plan as he had nothing to lose now. The man went to a pig pen. He caught the fattest pig in the pigsty, grabbed it by the head and held his knife near the animal's neck, intending to kill it. He was acting like a madman. His wife collapsed on the ground as she saw blood spilling everywhere while witnessing the violent behavior of her husband. After Mr. Kang slaughtered the pig, he continued to go to the riverbank. Everyone was freaked out. Their faces turned pale as soon as they saw him. It must be the aggressive look on his face that terrified them. Also the bloody pig head which was pierced with a hook that he was holding made them filled with horror. Out of curiosity the villagers followed him to the river as they wanted to know what he was up to. They quickly gathered at the place talking loudly. Mr. Kang planted a large pole deep into the ground. He wrapped it with a rope then tossed a hook and the pig head away. The pig head being thrown into the river made the water splash as soon as it touched the surface. In the jostling crowds of inquisitive individuals, some said Mr. Kang had gone crazy as they didn't believe in the existence of a sea monster in the village. But the man wasn't discouraged by it as he grabbed the fishing line firmly, waiting for the monster to come out. One, two, and then three hours had passed yet nothing happened. People started leaving as they assured themselves Mr. Kang had gone insane. Mr. Kang still patiently waited for the monster. His eyes started to get heavy, then slowly drifted into sleep. But the man couldn't even sleep peacefully as he saw the face of his granddaughter in his dream. Tani was like a little angel with her plump angelic face. The little girl walked closer to her grandfather as she put her tiny hands on Mr. Kang's face, trying to awaken him just like she usually did when he fell asleep during fishing. Mr. Kang quickly got up as he heard Tani calling him. Right that moment the fishing line suddenly became tight as if something had been caught on the hook. In the river waves were seen slowly forming as the water flowed ceaselessly. Knowing the prey had been captured, the old man hurriedly retrieved the fishing line as he felt something moving strongly in the water. The string rubbed against his fingers causing them to bleed. He tried to lean backwards whilst using his weight to pull the thing out of the river. A painful expression was clearly shown on his face as he frowned and grinded his teeth, yet he still clung onto the string. Realizing how useless it would be if he only used his hands, the man tried to place the fishing line on his shoulder. The great force caused the string to get tightened and cut his shoulder as blood dripped out of his wound. The monster was indeed powerful as it floundered him with just a single movement. Mr. Kang quickly clung to the wooden pole he had prepared before. But the man himself couldn't fight back the monster on his own. He started trembling with pain as the cut on his shoulder became deeper. In the water the sea monster was moving its tail violently, but his sheer willpower didn't allow him to give up easily as he continued to fight the monster for the whole night and collapsed later in the morning. At that moment there were some people walking by. They were in utter shock to see Mr. Kang being badly injured. Both his hands and his shoulder were covered with blood, his face contorted with pain, yet he was still holding the string. Seeing something bizarre in the water, the two men tried pulling the fish line and instantly felt its tightness. They quickly called the other villagers for help. Indeed, there was something really heavy under the water. Unexpectedly, the thing that Mr. Kang was fighting all night long was a huge fish. The size of its head was even bigger than that of a car. It was at this moment the villagers firmly believed that a monster had taken shelter in their village. As they pulled the monster out of the river, the villagers removed its guts. How terrifying it was, inside the guts was a human skeleton which was believed to be of Tani. My grandma sighed deeply as it was the most haunting part of the story to her which upset her every time she recounted it.
My younger sister was also unhappy with the ending as Tani had died so pitifully. She asked my grandma if Tani was the same age as her. My grandma smiled as she heard the question from my sister. She nodded her head while saying that Tani was a wonderful little girl yet had to die such a tragic death. My younger brother said the villagers were just evil. But my sister said it was also evil of the sea monster to kill the girl. I then told the two that the villagers were just as bad as the monster. The three of us had a quarrel over who was the most evil of them all. We kept arguing until our grandmother told us to go to bed as story time was over. We couldn't even close our eyes as we kept thinking about the tragic story. I asked grandma if there was any giant fish in the lake behind our house, but the reply to my questions was her loud snores. The main characters in today's story are Kiba and his family. After considering his circumstances, Kiba decided that his whole family would move to a large house so that his wife, children and old mother could have a more comfortable life. The new house that Kiba bought was close to the old one, so moving was quite convenient. Kiba had also bought new furniture to redecorate the house and make it more spacious and comfortable. Kiba's mother was 70 years old this year. Although she was weak, she was eager to help her son. Kiba's wife was also very excited, wanting to help clean the new house. Kiba told his mother to just relax and go for a walk around the house, leaving everything to him and his wife. Kiba's son was also extremely interested and intrigued by this new space, so he kept running around. By night time, the whole family had finally finished cleaning up this new house. Kiba was a very loyal son, so he prepared his mother's room thoughtfully, and before going to bed, he asked her if everything was good enough, and if she needed anything, she must just ask him. Kiba knew she had been cleaning and helping all day, so she should have an early night. He then advised his mother to sleep early and exited her room. Tomorrow morning, he would go to the market to buy some personal things for her. Then Kiba also returned to his room. His wife was putting things together in the room and his son was already sleeping. Kiba's wife asked him if his mom was asleep. She thought that she had looked a bit sad that day. Kiba said that maybe it was because she had to leave her old house where she created so many memories, but that she would be fine with time. Both Kiba and his wife slept until dawn, since they were so tired from the previous day. Since he didn't see his mother waking up early as usual, Kiba came knocking on her door. He kept calling her, but she didn't answer. Seeing that, his wife's face couldn't hide her concern. She suddenly recalled that his mom woke up early every day. Why would she get up so late today? A feeling inside her told her that something bad had happened. So Kiba quickly pushed the door down and entered, calling his mother's name. Once inside, Kiba saw his old mother still lying on the bed, carefully covered with the blanket. However, she still didn't respond to their words, not even a flinch. This made both of them extremely concerned. They both walked to the side of her bed and noticed she was okay. The daughter-in-law sighed in relief. She was sleeping so deeply that neither the husband nor his wife could wake her up. Then the couple decided to go out and let the mom rest. The mother kept sleeping all day until the night fell. It wasn't until dinner that Kiba's mother woke up and opened the door to enter the dining room. However, her face today looked strange. Kiba and his wife asked if she had a good night's sleep. 
but she said nothing. Just like that, the mother sat down on the chair, picked up a bowl of rice and devoured it. She ate it as if she hadn't eaten in days. Observing this, Kiba's face started to look surprised. She looked strange today. Something was off. Suddenly, Kiba's son screamed. His mouth stuttered and his whole body trembled. The boy looked at his grandma with horror, as if he had seen something terrible. He suddenly started growling. Kiba's wife asked him what had happened, but he only kept looking back and forth between his grandma and his mother while crying. He cried even louder, then pointed his finger at her and said it was not his grandmother. Kiba and his wife were both extremely confused as to what was going on. Kiba turned to tell his mother that she should eat slowly, otherwise she would choke. However, at that moment, the mother suddenly froze. Only an annoyed growl came out of her mouth. Kiba looked terrified. Why had his mother suddenly changed? Kiba's wife was so scared that she turned pale and thought, why had her mother-in-law become so scary today? Their son kept on crying louder and louder. After finishing all the food on the table, the mother stood up and walked straight back into her room. Kiba's wife knew something was wrong. Ever since they moved into this house, she seemed to be different. Scared and worried, Kiba followed his mother into the room to see if she had any health problems. He gently knocked on the door, called out to his mother and carefully stepped inside. But just like before, not even a single word came from her mouth. Only a terrifying growl. When Kiba approached her, she turned around and with a horrifying face, she shouted for him to get out of the room. She then started rushing towards Kiba, still shouting. By then, Kiba was truly terrified by his mother. But afraid of what might happen, he decided to look from the outside of the room. The wife thought her mother-in-law was dissatisfied with the change of houses and that's why she was acting so oddly. But Kiba disagreed and reassured his wife that when they moved in there, she was happy and that it was unlike her to get this angry. Then Kiba thought that maybe it was because she was unfamiliar with the place, but she would be fine after resting. After that, the couple also went to their bedroom, but they were both unable to sleep that night because of the strange events that happened that day. The next day, at the crack of dawn, Kiba woke up from his wife's screams. The wife was now holding her head down with her hands on her face. Kiba thought his wife had fallen or bumped her head against the wall, so he hurried to her. It turned out that wasn't the case. He could see that his wife's hair had been cut off by someone else. His wife just sat there in pain and panic. It was in that moment that Kiba started to really panic, realizing his mother was maybe the culprit. Despite how unlikely that might have been, he began to doubt the house. The wife kept crying and Kiba tried to comfort her, but it didn't calm her down at all. One shocking event was not over yet when another came they realized their son was nowhere to be found. Kiba and his wife started to worry, so they both rushed out to find their child. Although they searched everywhere, they could not find him. They were both truly afraid. Kiba even ran into the neighbor's house looking for his son, but no luck. The wife was at home, calling out for her son, but no response could be heard. They both felt helpless they clasped their hands and prayed for their son's well-being. Then, they suddenly saw the son run out of his grandma's room, holding a carefully framed photo. Kiba and his wife were surprised that their son ran into her room to play. Without saying anything, the boy held the photo frame that his grandmother gave him in front of them. Both of them looked at the photo and suddenly felt as if something cold ran through their spines. Their faces were still in shock. In the photo was a family of four, including an old woman, a couple and a son, exactly like Heber's family. The only discernible difference was that the woman's hair in the photo was shorter. Even more frightening 
Just a second later, the image of the mother in the photo suddenly turned into an image of Kiba's mother, but with a terrifying look. What is this all about? Kiba's wife exclaimed. Why is your mother in this picture? She showed extreme fear and concern. Surely this house was haunted. Why else would her hair be cut short when she woke up? And just like in the picture. Suddenly, at that moment, inside of Kiba's mother's room, a burst of flames came out. Kiba was so scared, so he asked his wife to watch over their son. He needed to run inside to save his mom. Inside the room was so smoky. Kiba tried to break in, hoping his mother would be okay. Once inside, Kiba stood and looked bewildered. The flames were so big. The person who caused the fire was none other than his mother, who was fanning the fire vigorously while shouting. Despite Kiba's best efforts to stop and bring her outside, she screamed and told him to get out of this house. Then she shouted that Kiba was a disloyal son and that he needed to give her life back. Ignoring her delusion, Kiba tried to stop his mother's odd behavior, then pulled her out the fire. As he did so, a large wooden bar fell straight down from the burning ceiling. The whole house was now engulfed in flames. His mother had passed out by now. Kiba tried his best to bring her towards the door. Kiba used all his strength to carry his mother and rushed out of the flames. Seeing him and his mother come out, his wife let out a small sigh of relief. Soon, the house was burned down. The fire spread too quickly and was too fierce and fast. The couple could only helplessly watch all their possessions dissipate in the rage of fire. A few hours later, the fire had gone out, but the house was left with nothing. Kiba and his wife quickly carried their mother into an ambulance. They don't know why it happened, but thought that perhaps this was the result of angry souls in the house. Through research, Kiba learned about the terrifying event that happened to the previous house's owners. The son and daughter-in-law tricked the mother into signing the rights to the house, to them, and kicked the mother out of it. But that same night, out of rage and revenge, the mother came back with a can of gas and burned down the house. The whole family of four died together in the sea of fire. The house was then rebuilt and sold to Heber's family who unexpectedly moved to the house filled with spirits. Kiba had no choice but to sell the land and move to another city. This horrifying incident happened to a friend of mine named Taryn. That afternoon, I asked my mom to go to the field with my friends. Since it was during our summer holiday, my mom agreed to let me go with them under the condition that I had to return early for dinner. I instantly rushed outside with my friends. Taryn was waiting for me at the door. No sooner had I seen him than I asked what game we would play for the afternoon. Taryn told me that the group intended to go for frog hunting and pick mangoes from a tree near to an abandoned house. Taryn's mention of the abandoned house instantly scared me as our parents forbid us to go to it. But Taryn didn't show a fearful expression on his face as he told me he usually hunted frog around that area. Having finished his sentence, he ran away leaving me standing in bewilderment. I hurriedly caught up with Taryn. As we made it to the place, we saw other kids hunting frogs in the bushes. However, oddly there was not a single frog to be seen. Taran told them to go further, as it would increase their chances of catching one. Then the boy courageously went to the direction of the house to our amazement. He used a stick to check on the ground and then carefully took a step forwards. At that time I could see him heading to the abandoned house. We ignored Taryn and went to another area, playing mock combat. Before I left, I told Karen not to go near the abandoned house since it was a dangerous place. However, I was sure that he wouldn't have the courage to go near it. Taryn was annoyed to hear me joking on him being a scaredy cat. 
He said there was nothing in this world that would scare him. My friends and I bursted out laughing loudly as we heard his remark. Then we challenged him to go inside the house. Taran confidently told us that he would get inside the house and flip it upside down in our presence. Now all of us felt slightly scared. Was he really out of his mind? In order to prove his bravery, Taran went near the house on his own. I slowly realized that my jokes had gone too far. Things had become more serious than I thought they would be. I couldn't let him go out like that. So we quickly followed him. Tarim was already at the door. He checked to see whether it was locked or not. Even though he didn't see the lock anywhere, the door was firm and not easy to break. Tarim told us that the door was likely to be locked inside or get rusted, which made it difficult for him to open. He said the house was safe, then told us to come closer and take a look inside. The calmness of Taran's face made us become less scared as we walked towards the house. As we gazed through the windows, what was inside the house instantly terrified us. There was a pit of snakes slithering on the floor, looking creepy. The snakes were long and scary. They flicked their tongues and hissed at us. The scene appeared before our eyes made us tremble. We couldn't even stand still. Seeing me being fearsome, Taran quickly made fun of me as revenge for being teased before. Taran then did something truly crazy as he stuffed straws into a small hole through which the snakes had gotten inside the house. It turned out that he wanted to burn all of the snakes. His face was flushed with excitement as he lit a match and threw it to the straws. Taran stepped backwards watching the burn while the three of us were still in shock. The fire started getting bigger and bigger. Soon enough the entire house was on fire as black smoke belched out densely. The snakes, unable to tolerate the heat, one by one slided out through the window. One of them wound its way to Taran. The boy unfearfully picked up a rock then hit it to death while looking amusedly. His actions were brutal. All of us were shocked to see him acting like that. That night, as we had already returned home, when it struck midnight, my mom suddenly woke me up as she'd received terrible news. My parents and sister asked me where I'd been to this afternoon as Taran had gone crazy. Meanwhile, many villagers were gathering in front of the house. I told my parents and my sister about the incident from the moment we walked to the abandoned house to when Taran burned it down. My mom and dad decided to go to Taran's house to inform his parents about the incident. Out of curiosity, I followed them. We saw a crowd gathering outside Taran's house. There must be something really serious happening to him. I tried to gaze inside his house, then saw something really haunting. Taran had been driven crazy. He held a stick in his hand then hit it midair constantly while yelling at something to go away. The boy looked like he had just seen a ghost. His face was terror stricken. Terence's mom was heartbroken to see her son like that. She tried to stop him. But Terence didn't listen as he hit his mom with a stick in his hand. Those who were presented at the scene couldn't believe their eyes to see Terence hitting his mother. He became more and more aggressive. Now the things that came to his sight were all horror. He saw hundreds of snakes winding their way to him. They all yawned, looking ferociously as if they wanted to eat him alive. The snakes then slithered all the way up his body. In just a few moments, Taram was covered with them. Some even squeezed around his neck that made him breathe raggedly. Taran waved for help. He kept shouting, but people couldn't figure out what he was doing as he was the only one that underwent hallucinations. A few moments later, from behind the crowd appeared Terran's father and the village chief. As the chief had been told about Terran's situation before, he knew the reason why Terran was acting like that. The man said Terran had killed off sacred snakes that were living in the abandoned house, thus he's being punished. Shortly afterwards, he surrounded Terran in a circle of sand. Terran standing in the circle somehow became weak his limbs weary as he collapsed on the ground. Later the boy was taken to his room. His mom had to stay up all night watching him as he had gone down with fever.
His face was filled with sheer horror. It looked like the pit of snakes still haunted him in his dream. I was amazed to see a layer of skin appearing on both Taran's arm and face. It looked like that of a snake. It wasn't until the skin peeled off that Taran was fully recovered from his illness. Ever since that day, Taran had become very fearful and timid. Even a small caterpillar could easily scare him. As I remember, this story began when I was only seven or eight years old. Back in my village, I used to play with Ben and Leo because not only were their houses next to mine, but we also got along very well. We often played by a pond, which was at the far end of the village, near the edge of the forest. One day, as soon as we got to the pond, we heard strange sounds coming from it, and we saw a lot of frogs, so we walked closer. Since we were young, we decided to throw stones at them. Watching the frightened frogs jump away, we laughed excitedly. Meanwhile, Ben was looking at something below the water, maybe because he didn't want to play our boring game. When I tried to throw a stone again, Ben told me to stop. He thought he saw a big fish underneath the water. When we looked down into the pond, we saw a fish swimming around, a big, strange rock. It was the first time we saw this fish, or any fish for that matter. So we decided to get into the pond to take a closer look. But while we were about to jump into the pond, it suddenly started to rain, heavily. We were all surprised, because the day had quickly turned from a nice sunny day into a dark stormy one. So we decided to run straight back home. That whole day, the rain kept falling. We stayed inside, for we couldn't do anything else in that weather. After the rain had passed, the air became cleaner, so we started our day as usual. Strangely, we felt uneasy, which seldom happened to us. The first person to get that feeling was Leo. He mentioned that he had a nightmare the previous night. Ben was next to comment about last night's dream. He made a serious, and then awkward face. He had also had a nightmare that night. Leo believed that these bad dreams were because of the rain soaking us by the pond. But Ben disagreed. He stared into space with a blank expression. Then he said, I dreamt of ghosts. It felt very real. I turned to look at Ben to ask him more about his nightmare. He quickly narrated what he had experienced in his dream the previous night. While trying to sleep, he got the urge to go to the bathroom. Half asleep, he got out of bed and went straight into the bathroom. Suddenly, as he reached for the toilet door, he felt a cold wind rush through his body. Ben was astonished when he saw what appeared to be a person coming out of the toilet. The person appeared gradually and became more visible. 
Bin panicked and shouted in horror. It was himself, or someone that looked like him. He froze in shock and was sure this would be the day he died. As he continued to observe the surreal event, the shadow walked past him. And, as it did, he felt clearly the eeriness and coldness coming from that weird entity. Then, slowly, the shadow moved into Bin's bedroom. He panicked and his face turned pale from the fright. Composing himself, he decided to use the toilet first. Maybe it was just an hallucination, he thought. The next morning, before going to school, he wondered whether he should tell his parents what he had witnessed the night before. After thinking for a while, he decided to tell his parents about this figure that appeared in his bedroom last night. When his mother heard the story, she looked annoyed. She said, Bin, you have watched too many horror movies. You are obsessed with them. Discouraged and unconvinced, he then said goodbye to his mother and went to school. After Ben had finished telling his story to us, I wondered why I didn't see anything strange like that. We were so caught up in our conversation that we didn't realize we had arrived at school already. That day at school was a tough one. I couldn't stop thinking about Ben's story. It was just so weird. During class, he kept yawning and falling asleep. He showed signs of sleep deprivation. In the late afternoon, the three of us were on our way back home after school. On the way home, we met a woman who was holding a little boy in her arms. As soon as the boy saw us, he pointed at Bin and cried out loud. Startled, we looked at the little boy, then quickly looked at Bin in confusion. I wondered why the child had looked at my friend and screamed. But Leo chuckled and patted Bin's shoulder. He said that maybe Bin's face was too fierce and this had probably scared the child to tears. On the way home that day, we had to cross an alley that was quite empty. Suddenly, a dog jumped out and barked at us. He stared at Bin and growled. His eyes turned red and looked very ferocious. We became frightened. Our faces turned pale. We didn't know what to do. At that moment, I shouted, run! So we immediately ran as fast as possible. After that day, Leo and I came back to check the dog out again. It was clear that the strange dog was only barking at Ben and he didn't behave the same way when we went back. I knew Ben seemed to realize that too. His face expressed obvious concern. The next day, we ran straight to the pond which we had visited the day before. The place looked different after the rain. The air was cooler and clearer this time. When I looked at the bank of the pond, I was surprised. It seemed like something had changed. I pointed to the water and told my friends about it. Under the water, the rocks, which we had seen the day before, were gone. Instead, large pieces of wood, which had probably come from the bottom of the pond, were floating. Maybe yesterday's rain caused the water in the pond to rise up. Suddenly, Ben called us and pointed towards something which was drifting in the water. I turned back to see what it was. It was an old, damp piece of wood. There were two frogs sitting on it. They reminded us about the frogs that had been on the rocks the day before. Then Ben asked Leah to help him explore the piece of wood with him. Why had it appeared near this pond? They jumped on it. Then. They imagined they were on a boat and started using a long branch as a paddle to row. 
Ben asked me to join them. He looked very enthusiastic. They immediately took the other branch to push their boat away from the bank. Suddenly, the boat turned and leaned to one side, which caused Ben to fall into the water. Leo was also startled and couldn't keep his balance, so fell too. While watching, I panicked. I saw Leo swim up from the water. His body was all wet. He tried to cling onto a piece of wood in front of him and gasped for breath. It was very hard for me to pull Leo out of the pond, but at last I did. Normally, this pond was quite shallow. Why did it seem so deep that day? Leo choked on water, but managed to tell me that he couldn't see Ben anywhere. I ran towards the pond and called for Ben in panic, but the water was very calm, as if nothing had happened just moments before. Everyone in the village went to this pond together to look for Ben after hearing the commotion. This pond was very shallow now, and strangely, not a trace of Ben could be found. The big piece of wood was also brought out of the pond. Some soil was still stuck to it. The log was moldy and slippery, and it seemed that was why they slipped. The villagers decided to bring pumps. They plugged the pipe to suck up all the water in the pond. There were about three or four pumps which worked at full capacity until the job was done. It took more than half a day for all the pumps to drain the water. Once drained, at the bottom of the pond, people found a large wooden coffin. All the villagers were instantly terrified. The coffin was upside down, but people realized immediately that the piece of wood was the lid of the coffin. Some strong young men stepped forward and used their strength to turn the coffin up. However, because of the dirt stuck to it on the bottom, it was extremely difficult to lift. After a while, they managed to overturn the coffin to its side. Everyone panicked because there was a body inside that resembled one of a child. I saw then that it was my friend, Ben. Everyone looked at each other with tearful eyes. It turned out that the reason why Ben's body did not emerge was because it was stuck in this coffin. No one knows how it happened, but many can imagine that it must have been something terrible and supernatural that held him down. After Ben's demise, everyone immediately spread the word, and no one dared to come to this pond ever again. It later turned into a large trash hole. I'm a guy who has a great passion for dolls, and this is a scary story about a spooky doll that I used to have. I bought this doll from a thrift shop located in Japan. It took me over a month for it to be delivered here. Having finished the payment, I brought the package inside. The doll was quite big and bulky. It took me a lot of effort to finally drag it into the house. Feeling excited, I took a paper knife and carefully opened the package. Needless to say, I was really nervous as I had waited a long time for this one. It was a clown doll. Its size was as big as that of an adult. The lines were immensely detailed which made the doll become so lively. 
I slowly removed the nylon layer. My first impression with the toy was that it was very well packaged. I was very satisfied with the doll as it gave me an eerie vibe when I looked at it. I didn't expect that it would be as tall as I was. During that time I had been hearing a lot about Japanese sex dolls which were made up very realistically to look like a human, so there was a high chance that mine was also made out of those materials. As I was leading a single life at that time, I considered the doll a friend of mine. I even slept with it, talked to it every time I felt bored. It was great to have someone that only listened to you without making any judgement. However, one night as I was sleeping I suddenly had a feeling that someone was watching me as I could feel them breathing near my face. I opened my eyes and looked around as my gaze stopped at the doll. I was startled. I remember having the doll laying on its back, but now it was laying on the side, staring at me. What was even more bizarre was that during those days, every time I got up, I always felt tired and dehydrated. But that didn't bother me much as I believed it was the excessive work that caused me to feel that way. Later when I had a girlfriend. I asked her to come over to my house. Even though I had told her about my hobby of collecting dolls, the clown doll made her feel a bit worried the first time she saw it. The doll wasn't supposed to look adorable, in fact it looked a bit scary so I could understand why she was afraid. I quickly reassured her then told her to wait while I get her something to drink. It was obvious that my girlfriend found it uncomfortable to sit next to the clown doll alone considering the fact that it had the size of an adult and a scary face. I pulled the drink as fast as I could so I could get back to her. All of a sudden I heard a fierce scream coming out of the living room. I quickly ran to check and was terrified to see the scene appearing before my eyes. The clown doll was laying on top of my girlfriend. She fearfully looked at me begging for help. I hurriedly pulled the doll out of my girlfriend and told her not to try lifting as it was really heavy, but she explained to me that she didn't have any intention of lifting it up. It was the doll that came at her. I reassured her again saying perhaps the scary look of the doll had terrified her and made her hallucinate. Her face was full of sheer terror. She instantly told me to put the doll into my wardrobe. Since I didn't want to upset her. I put on a smile and did what I was told at once. You stay here. It's gonna be my first time so don't hate me for leaving you in this wardrobe. That night, I finally succeeded in convincing my girlfriend to stay the night with me. The perfect moment had come. Since it was the first time for both of us, we instantly blushed as we looked at each other. My girlfriend gave me an affectionate hug and then a French kiss. As we were making out passionately, we breathed shallowly as if we were having asthma. As we were so caught up in our own business, all of a sudden she bit my tongue and screamed loudly, then buried her face into my chest, trembling uncontrollably. I asked her what had happened. She speechlessly pointed at the wardrobe doors. As I gazed at the wardrobe, I was astounded to find out that the door had been opened. I could feel my skin crawl as I looked at the doll's face slowly appearing in the dark. Its facial expression made it look so demonically. I went to the wardrobe, neatly placed the doll, then closed the doors firmly. I comforted my girlfriend afterwards and apologized for the doors being badly closed. But she was still scared as she had a premonition the doll was watching them, and it wasn't as inanimate as it might seem. I put on a smile as I listened to her and told her that she was just overthinking as the doll had been with me for over a month, yet nothing abnormally happened. However, she went on by telling me about the horror stories of ghosts living inside dolls in Japan, which made me feel slightly scared. I then promised that I would sell the doll if it could make her feel any better. The next morning I put the doll inside the original package whilst not forgetting to make an apology. <laughs> I'm so sorry for this, but I have to get married anyway. I'll get you a new owner. Then wrapped the doll with a plastic bag and sealed the package. Despite having a bit of regret, 
I believed selling the doll away was the best thing I could do under the circumstances. Later I went out to buy something for breakfast. As I was on my way I suddenly realized that I had forgotten my wallet, hence returning home. When I went to the door I heard someone screaming fiercely. Without hesitation I pushed the door at once. The terrifying scene appeared before my eyes made my heart drop to my stomach. The clown doll I previously placed in the storage room was on top of my girlfriend with a sharp knife in his hand. I rushed to her and pushed the doll away. It laid unmoving on the ground. How terrifying. The doll had left two deep cuts on my girlfriend's hand with the knife it was holding. My girlfriend told me it wasn't a normal doll. As I bandaged the cuts for her, I asked her what had happened. My girlfriend told me that while she was in a sleep, she heard footsteps outside the door. The door slowly opened to her amazement. Her eyes wide in terror. She panicked as she saw the thing in front of her. The spooky clown was standing by the doll, demonically laughing at her. Unexpectedly, the doll pulled out a knife. Its eyes turned bloodshot as it put on a sinister smile that revealed all the sharp teeth and laughed hysterically. The doll raised the knife as it got inside the house and approached her. In just a blink of an eye, the doll growled and jumped at her. My girlfriend was extremely terrified. She reflexively defended the attack with her hands, then got up the bed and rushed to the door. She threw the pillows at the clown doll in order to slow it down. The doll cuts the pillows in half with a sharp knife in its hand, causing the feathers to fall out. My girlfriend was caught by the doll as she made it to the door. Luckily, I was there in time to save her. As I checked around the room, there was indeed blood on the mattress, while the pillows had already been cut in half. Not allowing this to happen again, I brought the doll to a friend of mine, asking him to sell it for me. He told me that it would take him a while to get an owner for the doll since people were more interested in buying sex dolls rather than scary looking ones. I then told him about the horrific incident and advised him to sell it as soon as possible. But the man thought I was joking as he found it hard to believe in such a story like that. He even said that my girlfriend had made it up in order to get rid of the doll. However, when I told him about the cuts on my girlfriend's hand, he gradually believed me, as he had also been told about the horror stories of haunted dolls before. The doll must have been jealous of my girlfriend, as she had replaced it and made it become less important to me. Before I left, I once again told my friend to be careful with the doll and contacted me immediately if any problem arose. The clown doll might have developed a bond with me and there was likely some scary spirit being trapped inside of it. Since that day, I still hadn't gotten any information about the doll. However, I always had a feeling of being watched by someone. Two years ago, for the convenience of work, I moved to live in an apartment near my company. That afternoon, after coming home from work, I sat on the living room sofa and watched TV, as usual. Suddenly, there was a knock on the door. At that moment, I thought I heard wrong, or the people outside knocked on the wrong house, because I did not know anyone in this apartment complex. But then the knock on the door continued. The outsiders claimed they were the police. I was very confused. Why are the police looking for me? When I opened the door, it was true. There were two policemen standing in front of me. They said they wanted to get some information from me to assist with an investigation. Although I was surprised, I quickly regained my composure and agreed to the police's suggestion. Very quickly, the policeman pulled out a photo of this woman from his pocket. He asked if I had met this person. 
The woman in the photo also lived in this apartment and has been missing for many days. I told them I didn't know the woman. Then they told me the woman in the picture was missing. After that, they greeted me and continued to knock on each door to ask about the whereabouts of this woman. The police did not specify why she went missing and how long she had been missing for, but I didn't care much about this either. A few days later, I seemed to have forgotten this until one night. That night, with overtime, I came home late and was about to get into the shower. It was 11 p.m. I know that taking a bath at night is not good, but if I don't take a bath, I can't sleep. This time of night is the most relaxing time for me. I let my hair down freely and bent over to wash it. The strands of hair flutter in front of my eyes, but enough for me to see the void ahead through my hair. And then suddenly, I saw a pair of bare feet standing in front of me. I am sure my heart stopped beating for a moment. Feeling scared, I immediately raised my head. I reached to close the running tap. Every hair on my body was standing up. Looking around once more, I gradually calmed down. I thought maybe I was seeing things. It was just an illusion. But then, a thought flashed in my mind. I gradually felt the surrounding air become dense and colder. To prove that what I was thinking was just bullshit, I decided to try it again. I slowly lowered my head and glanced over the hairs in front of me. This time, no longer barefoot, standing in front of me was a woman with shoulder length hair and her hands hanging down. I panicked and shouted, then fell on the floor. The woman disappeared once again. I reached out for the towel and hurried to cover myself, then ran out of the bathroom fast. Until I lay on the bed, I was still trembling. That night I couldn't sleep because I was still so scared. After that night, I no longer dared to bathe at home. I have a colleague who was single and she was very happy to help me with this. The strange thing was that while at her house, nothing happened to me. My colleague assured me that it was just the new apartment that made me feel this way. I also hoped that everything would be fine. After spending a few days with my colleagues settling down and feeling my mood regain balance, I returned home. At home, I rarely cook. But I had a habit of boiling water for myself with an electric kettle to drink, rather than ordering the water available in the apartment. Every night, before going to bed, I had a habit of drinking a glass of warm water. This made it easier for me to fall asleep. Indeed, after drinking water, I lay in bed and tried to fall asleep. But for a long while, I felt the air around me was extremely cold. The cold and floating feeling made me feel like I was being immersed in water. Suddenly, I felt short of breath and my chest felt heavy. Then, I saw a floating object in front of me. I was speechless, unable to realize what it was. As my eyes gradually adjusted, I realized it was the figure of the woman with long, loose hair. The woman was moving closer and closer to me. Right now, I couldn't help but just stare at her with wide eyes. As her face approached me, the feeling of fear grew larger. It was a swollen and slimy face, like a corpse that had been soaked in water for a long time. The patches of skin on her body peeling off and fell into the water disgustingly. The person moved closer, almost on top of me. I was too scared that my hands and feet were stiff, unable to move. I just gasped and stared forward. I shouted out in fear, giving all my strength to try and get out of the situation. When I sat up in the bed, I realized it was just a dream. Even so, until a while later, I still felt terrified, wondering who she was. Why did I see that woman so often? 
The nightmare made me so anxious the next morning. I dragged my heavy footsteps out of the house warily. Missing notices are posted everywhere in the apartment corridors and staircases. It was an image of a lost woman. I suddenly realized something. How did that monstrous spirit resemble her so much? As I was thinking this, I was about to raise my hand to take a photo to get a closer look, but I suddenly felt scared. Really not wanting to believe it was true, I tried to flip through it to stop thinking about it. When I stepped out of the gate of the apartment building, I saw a group of old women gathered and gossiping. I'd never communicated with them and neither did they, but it was strange and when they saw me passing by, a woman took the initiative to call me back. She asked me if there were any strange smells in the drinking water, like a dead mouse. She then asked if I had sleep paralysis lately or had dreamed of ghosts. Another woman also mentioned the woman who had been missing for many days, all of them seeing her ghost. I was startled to react at this time. It turned out that I was not alone with this problem, and all of these people were like me. All of them doubted that the polluted water had anything to do with her. They must report this to the police. A few hours later, the police arrived. Everyone living in the apartment building was making a fuss. The police were now checking the water tank on the top floor of the apartment building. Something must have happened with the communal pool on the rooftop, for sure. That explains the problems they'd had recently, as well as the stench from the water. After watching the police pick up a body, everyone became extremely scared. After bringing a swollen, rotten body out of the water tank, they continued to use a fishing racket to remove something from the inside. It was scary, because the victim's whole body was decomposed in the water tank. What the police picked up might be the fat and rotting meat. When the police took the body out of the apartment building, everyone could smell a terrible stench that followed. The police also arrested the missing girl's husband and escorted him to the station. A few days later, the case was made public in the newspapers. The real killer was the husband of the missing girl. He killed her and threw her body in the pool terrace on the roof of the building. After everything was cleared up, I was sick for a long time. Every time I think about drinking dead body water, I feel very nauseous. That day, as the police department received an important report from an archaeological institute, they quickly arrived at the place. Mr. King, the head of the research team, together with his subordinates, were there to welcome them. Mr. King expressed his gratitude towards the investigation team led by Officer Chow. Thank you for your arrival here, Mr. Chow. Officer Chow asked Mr. King about the mysterious disappearance of the dead body as he demanded him to tell everything he knew about it. Mr. King said the ancient mummy they had previously found suddenly disappeared last night, three days before his excavation team had found an ancient tomb in the mountain. The tomb was located deep in the forest and was discovered by some hunters who immediately reported about it. To avoid damaging the objects which were buried with the tomb, Mr. King asked his subordinates to carefully remove them. As the coffin was finally carried out of the grave, Mr. King stared at it in amazement. The coffin was covered with an extremely fine paint. According to Mr. King, the paint was created way back to the Qing dynasty. Having years of experience in this field, Mr. King carefully inspected the outside of the coffin before removing its lid, as he wanted to make sure there was no toxic gases bottled up inside it. Wow. Everyone was in utter shock to see what was inside the coffin. 
It was a dead body that was still intact, dressed in a Qing dynasty costume. But the horrifying thing here was that the body had a wooden beam in the middle of its chest. One of the workers blurted out that the body was that of a living dead. While another guy claimed the corpse was of an older religious group that created the living dead. Both theories of the workers made sense to Mr. King as he believed the coffin had something unusual in it. One of the workers also added that there must be something sinister going on with the corpse since it was pierced with a wooden beam. Mr. King felt worried as he gazed at the corpse. Part of it was because he had looked up lots of information about ancient graves before. The worker told Mr. King about the story he'd heard before that the dead would awake if one removed the wooden beam out of it. Mr. King pointed at the corpse, telling others to look at its teeth. How terrifying. There were sprouted fangs inside its mouth, which meant that it had gone to the final stage of transforming into a demon. It would be an absolute horror if the corpse awoke from the dead. It would definitely bring calamity to humanity as those who got bitten by it would become zombies instantly. The director of the archaeological institute slowly approached from behind, laughing loudly as he said their theories were utter nonsense. The man didn't believe in the existence of zombies in real life. He held at the workers, then walked closer to the corpse. The director then pulled out the wooden beam out of the dead body then told the workers to bring it back to the institute so he could get it to the museum for display a week later. The excavation team brought the coffin and the corpse back to the institute afterwards. But last night, someone had broken into the place and stole the body. Mr. King accompanied Officer Chow to the room where he kept the dead body. The other officers started investigating the scene carefully. The only evidence they could find was an odd-looking handprint left on the door. Officer Chow asked Officer Ping to give him an investigation report. Officer Ping then pointed out something bizarre about the incident as based on what they had found at the scene. It looked like the corpse had left the place on its own. Chow was surprised to hear it as he found it too unbelievable. Indeed, there were no signs indicating an intruder breaking into the room. As they were heading back to the police station, Cha quickly went to see his boss Lu to report to him about the incident. What did you just tell me? That the corpse had awakened from the death and left on its own? Mr. Lu said. Lu asked Chao if he had fully investigated the scene. But Chao reaffirmed his belief to his boss that the dead body had indeed maneuvered. Later that afternoon, while Chao was analyzing the details he had about the incident, suddenly an officer came in, informing about a murder taking place and Chao was required to arrive at the scene. Chao asked the officer what had happened. The officer told him the murder took place early this afternoon at a market located in the suburb. A woman was approached by a strange man as she turned to see him. She was terrified by the look on his face. The man looked like a psycho. His eyes were bloodshot. Mouth was wide open, revealing the fangs as he unexpectedly attacked her. The man rushed to her with a tremendous force. He bit the woman by her neck as he slowly sucked blood out of it, which looked just like a bloodthirsty monster. After killing the woman, the man continued to chase after others causing them to frantically run away. Now, as the police had arrived on the scene, the man was seen completely transformed into a zombie. As the cops fired shots at him, he let out an aggressive growl, then collapsed on the ground. Now, everyone could clearly see the sharp fangs bearing out and his red eyes. Officer Chow realized this place was near to the archaeological institute which aroused his suspicions about the mysterious disappearance of the corpse inside the ancient coffin. Chao was in panic to see the scene appearing before his eyes. There were around five dead bodies laying on the ground. Chao ordered his subordinates to conduct an extensive investigation into the murder case while performing an autopsy on the dead bodies. 
The following day at the police station, a tense atmosphere prevailed in the room. Mr. Lou was furious as the situation seemingly got out of control. God damn it! These journalists are a bunch of fools for spreading the news of zombies killing people! The article stirred up rumors that the corpse had killed countless people, which struck terror into the people as no one dared to go outside. Mr. Lou lit a cigarette to calm himself down, then asked about the investigative process. Officer Chow told him that they were waiting for the results of the autopsy. Mr. Liu ordered Chow to go to the forensic laboratory to hurry them up as this murder case needed to be solved as soon as possible. If the process took any longer, social chaos would be sure to break out. Officer Chow followed his boss's order. He hurriedly went to the laboratory as the results of the autopsy had also come out. Inside the lab, the forensic pathologists were working tirelessly to speed up the investigative process, thus avoiding the situation from getting worse. As soon as Officer Chow asked them about the examination results, one of the doctors said that he would be amazed by what they found. The doctor showed him documents of the autopsy results. Chow expressed sheer amazement as he inspected the files. The pathologist also added they had discovered a fact that all the dead bodies carried rabies virus in their blood cells. But the odd thing was the virus had mutated and become much more complex, hence taking more time for the doctors to examine it thoroughly. One thing about the corpses that terrified them was that they all had bite marks left on their necks, which totally confused them. Officer Chow thanked the doctor then said farewell to him as he brought the documents back to his superiors. A month later as the investigation seemingly reached a dead end with no new information to be found, more victims claimed by the mysterious murderer had spread panic in the police station. Mr. Liu expressed his anger as he ordered everyone to put all efforts into solving the murder case. Meanwhile, people were advised to wear masks in order to protect themselves from the strange virus as the press had made the situation become more serious. That afternoon, at the police station, as everyone was having a meal talking about the murder case, Officer Ping said that he had just received a report from a civilian on the sudden appearance of rabid dogs in town. Many people were bitten, the situation worsened as the dogs lived in the area with those that had rabies all ended up being infected. Chow underestimated the situation as dogs carrying rabies wasn't something too abnormal to him. But Ping told him that the serious problem here was lots of people having been bitten by the rabid animals, which came as a surprise to Chow. Normally dogs with rabies would die after they bit someone. But these ones were different as they still survived while becoming stronger and ferocious. Chao got up, told everyone to move to the area immediately as no delay could be tolerated. Chao and Ping skipped their lunch. They hurriedly set out to the area that was invaded with rabid dogs. The car stopped in a suburban town. There was no one spotted at the scene which meant that they must have evacuated. Ping felt a bit of insecurity as the place was filled with utter silence. Sensing something dangerous, Chow told his teammates to be careful. No sooner had Chow gotten out of the car than he heard strange noises. Suddenly out of nowhere, a dog came into his sight. Chow was stunned to see the thing appearing before his eyes. The dog with the bloody mouth and bloodshot eyes was growling aggressively. It was infected. By the look of the dog, Chow could tell that it wasn't carrying normal rabies. In just a blink of an eye, the dog rushed to Chow. Chow reflexively rose his arms to defend himself from the attack. Blood was splashed as the dog bit him. As Ping witnessed Chow struggling with the ferocious dog, he immediately got out of the car to assist his friend. The man pulled out his gun, intending to take down the dog if necessary. Chow quickly hit the dog with a hammer, which made it jump backwards. However, shortly after that, the dog got up. It seemed like the hammer hit didn't do any harm to it. The bloodshot eyes of the dog, together with its aggressive look, gave Ping a firm impression that it had been infected. The dog was almost like an immortal, as a hammer hit it on the head would make one faint easily, let alone get up and attack. Ping asked Chow if he should shoot at the dog. Since the situation going in this town was more dangerous than Chow thought, 
he suggested returning for more reinforcements. However, as soon as Ping went back into the car to start the engine, he was shocked by what he saw. Officer Zhao, you need to see this! Ping held loudly. Behind them now, many other dogs slowly came out. The officers were surrounded by the scary aggressive dogs. Now it was impossible for them to return. Chao suggested to climbing on the roof as it was the best thing they could do under the circumstances. He pointed at a high wall and then told Ping to run towards it as soon as he gave a signal. The two of them ran headlong to the wall. From behind them the ferocious dogs were growling angrily, chasing after them. Chao and Ping made a high jump for the wall. However, both of them froze as they witnessed the horrific scene behind the wall. There were dead bodies on the ground while some people were seen standing in a bizarre manner. All of a sudden they turned around looking creepy as their mouths were covered with blood and their eyes were lifeless. The creepy looking people suddenly rushed towards the two policemen. Chao and Ping was frightened. These people were just as crazy as those rabid dogs. It seemed like the whole town had been infected with the virus. In a moment of carelessness Ping almost slipped down but thankfully Chao was able to grab him in time. The officers were temporarily safe as they stood on the high wall. However, it was a serious dilemma for the two as they were surrounded by a pack of aggressive dogs and a group of crazy people who wanted to eat them alive. Walking along the wall, the two managed to get to the roof. Now as they were standing on a higher spot, they realized the situation had become worse than they thought. There was nowhere else for them to escape. The whole place was filled with infected people. They were moving like dead people but somehow behaved threateningly. Realizing the extreme danger of the strange virus, as it had caused everyone in town to turn. Officer Chow suggested finding a way to escape and call for reinforcements. Unexpectedly at that moment the two heard someone calling them. There was a woman and a little girl waving for help. It looked like they hadn't been infected. Chow told Ping to cover him from above as he came down to save the woman and child. Without a bit of hesitation, Chao climbed down and went to save the two. The woman burst into tears as she told the officer that everyone in town had gone crazy. She and her daughter had been trapped here for two days. Then Chao helped the woman and her daughter climb onto the roof. The situation became extremely dangerous as noises of doors banging were growing louder. It seemed like the aggressive monsters were about to get inside. The door bar seemingly couldn't hold any longer as the monsters kept screaming and banging, which attracted more of them to the place. Officer Chao hurriedly pushed the woman upwards to the roof. All of a sudden, Ping yelled loudly. He told Chao to climb up quickly as the monsters were about to enter. Chao gazed at the door. He instantly got frightened as the door bar was about to break. In just a moment, the door was bursting open as the infected rushed towards Chao. The monsters were fast and agile. They also had long canines which made them look extremely ferocious. Realizing it was too late to keep climbing, Chao felt a surge of panic. The group of crazy people frantically attacked him. Chao instantly knocked down a guy from behind with his elbow. As he was surrounded by these ferocious madmen, he kept throwing punches at them. However, these people no longer felt pain as they stood up immediately and continued to attack Chao. Chao needed to get out of his mess quickly. As the right moment had come, he quickly jumped onto the wall. He tried his best to climb while the crazy people were underneath him, aggressively rushing towards him. One of them grabbed Chao's leg. From above, Ping was grabbing Chao as he tried his best to pull the man up. As the monster clung onto Chao's leg, he was injured as blood spilled out the moment he pulled up his leg. Chao breathed shallowly. What a narrow escape it was. These people were so strong and ferocious. Chao suggested that they needed to leave this place before it was overrun with zombies. The two policemen led the woman and her daughter to a safer shelter. They stopped at the terrace as it looked quite safe to them. Chao told everyone to stay quiet as noises could lead the zombies to them. Since it was too dangerous to get back to the car and call for help, Chao said that he had come up with his own plan. The man turned his gaze at a haystack saying that he could use it to make a signal for help. The group waited until the sun went down then burned the haystack in the hope that the burning object would send out signals to the police. 
The little girl asked her mom if the zombies would break into and find their whereabouts. Officer Chow quickly reassured her, saying the police would arrive and save the four of them. Chow then asked the woman what had happened to the civilians. The woman said a few days ago everyone in town suddenly acted bizarre after they ate a pig. That day the dog of the village chief had bitten a pig to death. The pig owner demanded the village chief to pay for it as he wanted to settle the argument peacefully. The village chief agreed to the man's demand. Thinking that the pig was only bitten to death by a dog and would be a waste if he dumped it, the chief decided to cook it as he gathered everyone for a feast. The people in the village were all invited to his house as they feasted on the pork. All of a sudden, they behaved oddly as they fought and killed each other. It was fortunate for the woman and her family to avoid the horrific incident as they didn't come to the gathering. Bing abruptly held out as he saw the rescue team arrived. They finally saw the signal for help and brought the whole team to save the survivors. Many police cars had arrived at the scene. The soldiers were all equipped with antivirus equipment. They used tranquilizer guns to shoot at the infected. The zombies, after being hit with the bullets, somehow returned to normal as their eyes were no longer red. The two policemen, the woman and the little girl were all safely rescued. Later, the police imposed a blockade around the whole town for decontamination and disinfection. Now, at the military hospital, Officer Chow had fully recovered after two days of treatment. All the wounds on his arms and legs had been antiseptic and bandaged. Chow expressed his gratitude as the research center had developed a cure, or else he would be infected with a strange virus. But the examiner said it was not over yet. He told Chow to follow him to the morgue as he wanted to show him something. The man removed the veil of a corpse, then told Chow to look at the bite and then the dead body. He was aghast to see the wound on it. This was the man that was first infected with the virus. However, the bite on his neck had a strange looking shape. Chow asked the doctor if the bite mark was from the missing mummy. The doctor looked at Chow, saying it was a warning sign that must not be ignored. This man had indeed been bitten by the mummy, which meant that the virus was originating from that. Inside the mouth, the canines had grown long, which served as proof that he had transformed into a vampire after being bitten. Chow told the doctor that if the process for cure development was delayed, there would be a lot of people, including him, being turned into bloodthirsty monsters. The doctor agreed with his statements. It was fortunate that they had stopped in time, or else it would be a doom to humanity. The next day at the police station, Mr. Liu once again became angry as the press still reported news about the missing of the ancient mummy. Later, he ordered the police officers to find out the mummy at all costs and burned it as it was the only way to make things right. As Officer Chow walked out of the room, he had a feeling of worry. There must have been someone behind the mysterious disappearance of the ancient corpse. And for that reason, he couldn't make certainty of anything until he found the mummy. Today, Mr. San went to pick up his nephew from the countryside. He just got a job at a horror comic company. Knowing that, San immediately wanted to tell him a ghost story that happened 10 years ago with his two colleagues. Masa and Kosho were a young couple. Currently, they were both teachers at a high school. That day, they finished work later than usual because they had to attend an important school meeting. It was already dark when they left the office. Most of the people decided to stay in the school dormitory. Masa also asked her husband to stay. However, Kosho immediately disagreed. He said that they must go home to take care of their old mother. Masa really did not want to go home at night. 
but she had to follow her husband to the parking lot. There was a reason why Massa felt so wary about driving at night. Their home was not far away, but they also had to pass through a massive grave. This was the burial place for homeless people, so that was a terrifying thought. And there were also many mysterious rumors about this place. Riding through the streets in the suburbs, a cold feeling immediately came over them. Massa sat on the back of the bicycle, and the cold wind made her restless. Her heart started to beat faster and faster. The closer they got to the tombs, the more scared she felt. She thought about the rumors about the white shadows with bleeding eyes. Thinking about it, Massa suddenly shivered. She hugged Kosho unconsciously, and this gave him a fright. Kosho did not pay much attention to evil things. He thought she was just being silly, so he teased her. Kosho's teasing still didn't help. In order to ease her fear, she then closed her eyes and prayed. But when she closed her eyes, the feeling of fear grew even stronger. Massa felt like someone was watching her. Unable to take it anymore, Massa quickly opened her eyes. Then, she saw a white shadow flickering behind the bushes. Massa panicked. She closed her eyes again, and then opened them again. But still, she saw this white figure standing there. Then, the figure started running after them. But Massa stayed quiet, with no reaction. Still, staring in disbelief, the bike suddenly leaned to the side and crashed. They had hit something. Luckily, Massa quickly put both hands on the ground, so there was no serious injury. Then, Massa turned to look at her husband. But just from the shadow on his back, she could tell something was not right. Kosho lay motionless on the ground, as if nothing had happened. His face was dark. Worried for her husband, Massa stood up with both hands and went closer to observe, even more panicked. She had never seen Kosho look so silly. He was even drooling down the corner of his mouth. Her heart suddenly started to beat faster. She remembered the white shadow that she saw earlier. Maybe Kosho was possessed. Although her heart was filled with fear, she could not leave her husband behind. Then, Massa helped Kosho stand up and took him home. Massa didn't know why she felt so insecure when Kosho cycled in front, so she asked her husband to sit behind her. Unlike his usual personality, when Kosho heard that, he happily agreed and even urged his wife to quickly return home. More than anyone, Kosho knew that Massa was not good at cycling, but today he agreed to let her drive. It was weird. As soon as they got home, Massa saw her mother-in-law waiting at the door. It seemed she had a feeling that something was not right. Seeing her mother-in-law and feeling overwhelmed the entire way, Massa cried loudly and told her what happened. After telling her she saw the white shadow and all about her husband's strange behavior, the mother's face immediately changed to a shade of pure white. As if she had just understood something, she did not say anything. She quietly just went inside to the altar to burn some incense. After she finished burning the incense, she approached her son. Her face and voice also changed. She was shouting at a stranger to get out of his body. Kosho immediately folded his arms, admitting he was a lost spirit. So he entered Kosho's body to find something to eat. It seemed as if the mother had encountered something like this before. After talking to him, she immediately turned her head to tell her daughter-in-law to go prepare some food. Masa didn't understand what she was going on about, but quickly went to the kitchen to cook up a bowl of noodles. Just a few minutes later, the bowl of noodles was empty. It seemed that the soul had been starving for a long time. After eating one bowl, he asked for one more, promising after eating he would immediately leave. Seeing this, the old woman did not deny him another bowl of noodles and immediately sent her daughter-in-law to cook more. 
Just a few minutes later, the second bowl of noodles was brought out. The spirit quickly accepted it with a hungry face. Just like that, one, two, three, and six bowls of noodles were put away, but still couldn't fill his hungry stomach. Unable to take it any longer, the old woman shouted loudly. After she finished speaking, the spirit immediately sobbed, saying that he also wanted to go, but he could not. Seeing this, Masa approached and pleaded softly. The spirit did not want to hide anything and told the truth about his case. It turned out that the white shadow that Massa saw was another spirit, and because he was threatened by it, he tried to enter a human. In order to save her son, the old woman had to say that she would help him, but with the request that after being done, he must immediately set her son free. As the woman spoke those words, he had no reason to refuse. He immediately nodded and accepted the mother's request. Then. He said nothing. He silently turned his gaze towards the main gate, as if to signal something. Seeing the actions of the soul, the mother immediately understood. She hurried to tell the daughter-in-law to watch the house and went out. A moment later, she saw her coming back inside with an old man. This man, Zen, had an extraordinary ability to defeat demons. After listening to everything, he looked very serious, holding out an incense burner in the middle of the yard. Then he burned a large bunch of incense and clasped his hands together. Once done with that, he turned back and told the mother and daughter to follow behind him and not say anything. Although they didn't know what he was planning to do, they were worried about Kosho. They then kept quiet and followed. After a while, Masa suddenly stopped and stared at the wall next to the entrance. She shouted, calling for her mother-in-law and Mr. Zen to come. It turned out that there was a human face on the wall, looking at them. After observing carefully, Mr. Zen immediately told them to stand aside. Then, he lifted the laser and pointed it straight towards the face of the demon. Mr. Zen lowered his voice. He began to mutter a strange spell. Unexpectedly, that face gradually faded and disappeared into the nothingness. Finally, it seemed like everything settled down. But the mother was still concerned that the hungry ghost might be tricking them. She asked Mr. Zen to talk to him. Mr. Zen went straight towards Kosho's body, telling him that he had banished that soul forever and that now he was able to go. Not only that, he also added that if he had any further requests, he will happily respond. The soul immediately sighed and replied, He's always starving. He had no worshipper. He just wanted to be full. Hearing that, the mother interjected, promising to prepare delicious food and wine every day. The kindness of the old mother and that of Mr. Zen left no reason for the soul to stay anymore. After thanking them, he disappeared. Kosho violently convulsed, then passed out. Kosho had been unconscious for two days. When he woke up, he couldn't remember what had happened to him. He only felt severe pain through his head. His stomach was very uncomfortable, as if he had just eaten three days worth of food. Our family was eating lunch together then suddenly heard someone knocking on the door loudly. My mom couldn't hide the amazement on her face. She told my dad to go out and look who it was. My dad opened the door and looked around. It was Mr. Kun, one of our neighbors. He looked anxious as sweat was dripping down his face. 
Mr. Kuhn asked my dad to help him take his son to the hospital urgently as he was in critical condition. My dad quickly reached to his jacket and then went with him. As Mr. Kuhn slowly regained his composure, he told my dad that his son Kalim was suffering from a strange disease that made him unable to move. Out of curiosity, I decided to follow them. My dad switched on the engine of his truck. He usually used it to carry farm produce in my village. Even though my dad told me to stay home, I insisted on going with him. My dad held at me. Stay home! This is none of your business! But I tried to convince him to let me go with him, even promised not to cause him any inconvenience on the way. As they were in a hurry, my dad agreed to take me with him. The loud noise came from the truck engines created an atmosphere of tension which made us feel really distressed. As we arrived at Mr. Khan's house, we saw our neighbors gathering in front of the gate, talking loudly. My dad and Mr. Khan quickly went inside. At that moment, I was really curious to know about Kalim's situation. From my spot, I could see Kalim's mom in the house, assisting her son up as he was on the ground. His belly was bloated. It was so big that it made him look like a frog. He was screaming in pain. I could see his face turn pale as the pain had worn him out. His limbs were numb as he couldn't move at all. My dad and Mr. Kuhn lifted him up to the truck, but he was extremely heavy, like a big stone. As Kalim finally got into the truck, we made our way to the hospital instantly. We carried him to the emergency room. Things got worse for Kalim as he was required to undergo surgery in order to remove something out of his stomach. My dad asked Mr. Kalim how his son ended up being like that. Mr. Kuhn sighed when he heard the question from my father. He had no idea what had happened to his son, as the young man was seen lying on the ground, hands covering his belly this morning. My dad quickly reassured him, saying perhaps it was just food poisoning. The surgery was finished an hour later. Luckily, Kalim was no longer in danger. As Kalim had regained his composure, we decided to go check on him. Mr. Kun asked Kalim what had happened. The doctor said they had found mud and rocks in Kalim's stomach, which caused his belly to bloat like that. Kalim couldn't believe what he just heard. He breathed a weary sigh, then told us what had happened. Last night, Kalim, together with his partners, were on his last shipment of the day to the market. Everyone was exhausted at the end of the day. Kalim invited his co-workers to have a meal with him before they returned home. But they thought it was a bad idea to eat out this late at night. So they turned down his offer and told him to get home soon. They said goodbye to each other and left. As Kalim was riding his bicycle on the familiar path, he began to whistle in order to disrupt the quietness surrounding him. All of a sudden he felt like there was an extra weight as if there was someone sitting on the bike seat. As the man turned around, he saw a young woman sitting behind him. The woman greeted Kalim, asking why he returned home so late. It wasn't much of a surprise for Kalim to see this woman as the two had met before. The woman always asked him for a ride every time she saw him going past the street. But he was wondering how he didn't have any idea about her getting on his bike. What was even stranger to him was when Kalim started a conversation with the woman, she stayed silent and ignored him. The woman told Kalim to stop the bike. It was at this moment something terrifying happened to him. As Kalim turned around, he no longer saw the woman being with him. He confusedly looked around, searching for her. But what came into sight was just a vast, empty space, with no houses to be seen. Was the woman's house deep in the forest? Kalim was really curious about her. Kalim continued to pedal his bike. Suddenly, he saw three strangers coming out of a clump of bushes as they walked towards him. Kalim was amazed. He wondered to himself why these three men were blocking his way. One of the guys talked to him. Hey. The man said he and his friends had just finished their shift at work 
and were on their way home. The group intended to paint the town red tonight as they'd received their payday. Kalim's eyes dilated as he listened to the guy. Being absolutely under with work for days made him crave the smell of liquor. Knowing Kalim wanting to join the group, they asked him to go with them. Their amiability made it impossible for Kalim to turn down the offer. They took him to an abandoned housing block which looked pretty hushed and scary. Kalim felt worried. He came up with the reason of living far away from here yet had to return home early, then said goodbye to them. But one man in the group refused to let him leave. He told Kalim to stay as it was dangerous to go outside this late. And moreover, Kalim could stay the night in his house and had a drink with him. The man even told Kalim they were working at the same company. Then he guided Kalim to a large, spacious house. As soon as he walked in, the smell of food instantly caught his attention as his stomach growled. They told him to sit at the table while bringing out liquor. At first, Kalim was quite shy to be there. He timidly scratched his head. As the host poured out the wine, he told Kalim to make himself at home and enjoy his stay there. The man raised a toast to Kalim. His hospitality made him feel really comfortable. Kalim was no longer being timid as he drank up his glass of wine. The men all together raised their glasses to celebrate their friendship. They drank and chatted happily afterwards. As it was nearly morning, Kalim had eaten up all the food on the table. He couldn't stop complimenting how delicious the food was while enjoying the dishes. As Kalim gulped his last glass of wine, he fainted on the table. His face turned red and his body was reeking of alcohol. When he woke up, the sun had already set. As the man opened his eyes, he felt aching throughout his whole body as he trembled and felt an immense pain in his stomach. When Kalim looked down, he panicked to find out that his abdomen was swollen while the pain became more and more unbearable to him. It's not to say that at the moment his body was covered with mud. There was more stuff in his mouth and sand remained in his mustache. He found himself lying inside a deep hole, in the middle of nowhere while the tree people he met last night had disappeared. Kalim wondered if it was him being too wasted that they dragged him out of the house. He stood up, tried to climb out of the hole, but the man was terrified by the horrifying scene in front of him. There were graves appearing before his eyes. The majority of them had been desecrated. Kalim stood in bewilderment witnessing the horrific scene. He was filled with sheer terror as he told us about the incident. After being discharged from the hospital, Kalim returned to the place with his dad. Turned out that it was a mass grave of a family which was involved in a traffic accident. Around the area, people usually saw a female ghost asking them for a ride and the mysterious men trying to lure someone to their whereabouts. That night in a bar, I met my friend from secondary school again. She told me a story about a ghost. Lena's parents used to work in a big textile factory. She often studied in a public school downtown. Because of the insolvent company, her parents had to find jobs in other places, which were far from her school. Therefore, they usually picked her up late. One day at school, a boy named Tom introduced himself to Lena and asked her to play games with him. As they were the same age and Tom was very friendly, Lena was delighted when she had a friend to play with. Very soon it became afternoon and Lena's father came to pick her up. Lena said goodbye to Tom and they left with her father. The next two days, Lena met Tom again. Lena wondered about Tom's parents. Why didn't she see them? 
Tom told her that his parents were very busy, so he usually went home alone. Then the two of them played in the sand in the yard, and after a while her teacher said, Your mom will pick you up early today, so you shouldn't play in the sand alone. After the teacher left, Tom immediately invited Lena to discover a factory next to the school. He wanted to share a secret with her. Lena hesitated for a moment about Tom's suggestion. She thought, my mom and teacher will be angry if I go too far. But not waiting for Lena to reply, Tom quickly held her hand and ran towards the factory. Tom took Lena through a secret passage to the factory. Getting inside, Lena felt very excited. This place was a mystery to her. Tom took Lena a bit further. They saw a huge, abandoned factory. Even so, the little girl was still very scared. She wondered if they were allowed to be in here or not. She was about to go back, but suddenly Tom quickly grabbed her by the hand. He pointed at something and asked Lena if she had seen it. Following his hand, she saw a very cool red toy car. As soon as she saw it, Lena was fascinated. For a long time, she wished to have a car. Her family was poor, so her parents had not bought any toys for her before. Playing with the toy for the first time, she controlled the car smoothly and quickly. It was so fun, so she forgot all the teacher's words. Then. The car sped out of control and into an old blue iron door and stopped. Lena felt very strange. She didn't understand what made the car st stop so abruptly. So difficult to control. The little girl ran to pick up the toy. She held it and looked at the door curiously. When she looked up at her friend Tom, he seemed very strange with an expressionless face and wide open eyes. Tom's eyes increasingly appeared more and more blood red with horror. Then Tom suddenly shouted at Lena, find me. Tom's face now scared Lena to death. The little girl stepped back. Lena did not think that Tom was so aggressive with her. She was so confused as to what changed. Then Tom turned his back to go inside that old blue iron door. The door was locked with iron chains, but it was so easy for that child to get through it. Left alone, Lena stood outside and looked at the door for a long time. Her arms still hugged Tom's red toy car. Thinking Tom wants to play hide and seek with her, Lena immediately snuck in to find him. The space on the other side of the door was wide and completely empty. It was so quiet, except for the sound of her own footsteps. The little girl looked around the huge, wide space, and she wondered how she would ever find her friend. In this strange place, Lena could not control her tremble. Holding the toy in her hand, she became more and more frightened. Lena called out to Tom and begged him to go home with her. She did not want to play hide and seek in this scary place anymore. Responding to Lena's words, there was an echo from the deep inside the factory. It was Tom's voice. He wanted Lena to go inside and find him. Although she really wanted to leave the factory as soon as possible, Lena was very scared and she did not know how to get out of there without Tom's guidance. She decided to find her friend. But the moment she took a step, a familiar voice rang out. From outside the door, Lena's teacher suddenly appeared. It already turned dark outside, and the factory, with the teacher, seemed very worried because the iron chain was locked, which did not allow her to enter. Lena hurried towards Tom's voice. She told him that the teacher had come and they should go out together. However, replying to Lena was her own echo. There was no sound, no one there except her. The toy was still lying on the ground, but Tom did not respond to her. Lena really didn't want to leave Tom there at all. He hides very well, Lena thought. 
Outside the door, Lena's mother appeared and urged her to run out. Lena's mother looked bewildered when she heard her little daughter was talking to someone. She did not want to wait any longer. Lena left the toy car and said goodbye to Tom before going out. Then she followed the gap in the door and got out. Seeing her daughter come back safely, her mother was so happy. She had heard many stories about the factory, which was rumored to have cannibal monsters. At home, Lena's mother asked her to tell her everything. Her mother was very surprised and disappointed because Lena had played at the factory on her own without permission. Lena's mother got angry. If she was late, what would have happened to her little daughter? Lena's mother was angry because Lena didn't listen to her. She also thought her daughter had lied to her. Feeling sad, the little girl only knew to stare at the ground and listen to what her mother was saying. That night, in a dream, Lena found herself walking into a dark place. It was cold and foggy. There was a very sad boy sitting and holding his knees. She recognized him. Tom. As soon as she saw Tom, Lena was very angry because that afternoon he left her alone in the factory and later got scolded by her mother. When Lena was about to question him, suddenly Tom turned his face towards Lena. His face looked awful. Blood covered most of his body and had completely dyed all of his clothes red. Suddenly, Lena woke up from this nightmare and she was sweating all over her body. But outside, Lena heard her parents arguing. Her father claimed that her mother was superstitious. A cannibal monster in the factory? But the mother still insisted on keeping her point of view about the monster. That night, Lena slept with her parents to avoid nightmares. Her parents were still very angry at each other because of the argument. The next morning, as soon as she woke up, her mother said it was not necessary to go to school anymore. Lena was going to live with her grandmother for a while. Later that day, her mother took Lena to her grandmother's house, which was more than five hours away from the city. All procedures for transferring schools and entering new schools was going to be completed by her parents soon after. A week later, Lena began to get used to the new environment, the new school and her new friends. One day, on the way home from school, she was attracted by this information on the newspaper stand. There was a picture of a dry skeleton, whose outfit is very familiar, and there was also a red toy car next to the skeleton. All of them were very similar to Tom. It was written in the paper that a body of a boy, who was believed to be missing a few months ago, was found. People thought that the boy fell from above with a toy car after sneaking into the abandoned textile factory. Tom had been in this lonely and cold place for so long and he just wanted to play hide and seek with Lena. This scary story is about a young man named Shin. That day Shin together with his uncle went outside to dig a lake for fish farming. They had to finish it before the wet season arrived. The soil here was pretty stony which made both Jin and his uncle feel wearily. As the two were digging, Shin discovered a pile of soil protruding from the ground, which looked like a grave. Shin immediately informed his uncle about it. The uncle was amazed as Shin pointed at the spot for him to see. The uncle thought for a moment then told Shin, We should go check on it. The dirt pile was actually a huge lump of soil. Shin and his uncle had to lift it up and put it aside. Shin and the uncle were surprised to see the thing underneath it. The uncle told Shin, Who on earth would bury such a statue down here? 
The statue had a human face shape which looked like that of a woman. It was beautifully crafted. The two were extremely curious to know about its origin. The uncle closely looked at the statue and then told Shin to help him dig it up. The two started digging. They had a firm belief that the statue was something highly valued. The face of the statue slowly appeared under the layer of dirt. It was a gorgeous female that had the beauty of an Asian woman. As the two raised it up, Shin was astounded by its great beauty. The uncle carefully looked at the statue. All of a sudden, at the moment he looked into the eyes of the statue, he got startled. Eyes dilated with horror. He backed up instantly, which made Shin surprised. The man's voice trembled with fear. He told Shin, We are going to die. Shin didn't understand what had happened to his uncle. The old man stuttered, hurriedly told Shin to bring the statue deeper into the forest. Despite being confused, Shin obediently did what the uncle told him to do without disposing it. Yet he asked his uncle what had happened. The uncle said nothing as he told Shin to quickly bury it. The two brought the statue to a spot deep into the forest. They dig a hole then put it aside. The uncle then covered it up. He couldn't stop being scared as the man buried the statue. He muttered something under his breath, begging for forgiveness. The statue was covered with layers of dirt. Never in Shin's life had he seen his uncle being this scared. How strange it was. The statue was just an inanimate object. After the two buried the statue, they quickly returned home. That night the weather unexpectedly got colder as blasts of cold wind howled. As the uncle was in his sleep, he suddenly opened his eyes. There were sounds of footsteps outside. The man slowly went step by step, not to wake his wife up. As he went to a window, he drew the curtain aside to gaze. His nephew Shin was seen opening the gate and going outside. He walked clumsily, looking like a sleepwalker. The uncle wondered what Shin was doing out there this late. Sensing something bad about to happen, the man put on his jacket, then followed Shin. The uncle felt suspicious as he saw Shin acting strange. The door was left open when Shin went out of the house. He didn't even bother to close it. But scarier than that, Shin had completely disappeared into the pitch darkness. How could he move so fast? At that time there was no one else on the streets, only utter silence prevailed. The old man looked around, he checked every single corner yet his nephew was nowhere to be seen. Then a disturbing thought crossed his mind which terrified him deeply. He quickly made his way to the forest. Like a shudder premonition, the uncle's face was pale and filled with horror as he wanted to find Shin before the sun came up. What the man expected turned out to be true as he saw Shin sitting on the spot where the two buried the statue. Shin was on his knees digging up something. The uncle watched his nephew for a moment. He called Shin but Shin didn't reply to him. He slowly approached him. Terrifyingly, both hands of Shin were badly wounded as blood was dribbling from them, while the statue was slowly revealed under the dirt. Feeling horrified, the uncle yelled loudly at Shin, telling him to stop. However, despite his uncle trying to stop him, the young man just kept digging and digging. His face became scary as he put on a haunting smile. The uncle acted quickly as he grabbed Shin and dragged him away from the spooky statue. But the strange thing was, as Shin was being kept from the statue, he screamed painfully then attacked his uncle. Shin screamed hysterically while rushing to the statue, continuously called it his wife. His scream echoed throughout the whole forest in the black night. The uncle struggled desperately to get Shin out of the forest and return him home. Inside a small house with the lights on, Shin acted insanely to his uncle and aunt's amazement. He was sitting on his bed, <laughs> hugging a pillow while smiling happily. The young man even coddled it as if it was his lover. Having no other choice, the uncle had to tell his wife about his encounter with the spooky statue. The wife couldn't hide the horror on her face. She asked him if it was the haunting statue that the villagers had been talking about all those years. 
Shin indeed had been possessed, which meant the myths about his statue were all true. Since the statue had aimed for the young man, he would be haunted to death. The woman then told her husband to hurriedly find a black dog in order to remove the spirit out of Shin by using the old ways their ancestors had taught them. She also emphasized that the dog must be an old one, as it would be more effective for the incantation. Immediately, the uncle ran to the nearby village to get himself an old black dog. The old man then returned with the dog as he saw his wife impatiently waiting for him. The dog fixed its eyes on the bed that Shin was sitting on, then growled as if something had caught its attention. It barked loudly afterwards. A tense atmosphere soon prevailed in the house. Shin felt horror as he trembled helplessly. The man stepped backwards while holding his pillow looking terrified. As the man was in terrible fear, he bursted out crying loudly, then fainted shortly after that as the dog stopped barking at him. Feeling extremely worried, the aunt quickly checked up on Shin. She called out his name and prayed for him to pull through. The uncle couldn't hide the worried expression on his face either. Luckily, Shin had eventually woken. The aunt couldn't be happier to see him making it out alive, but Shin was still in utter bewilderment. He asked her, What's happened? Why am I lying here? Then he grabbed his head and groaned as he felt an immense pain. The young man looked down at his hands. He was shocked to see them being covered with wounds and scratches. They also bled while the fingertips were badly swollen. The uncle and his wife looked at Shin, then asked what had happened with him. But even Shin himself couldn't remember exactly what the situation he had gotten into to be this terrible. All he could remember was this one dream coming into his mind as he tried to recall it and tell it to his uncle. He said he was awoken by a female voice. The voice echoed distantly as it aroused his curiosity. He unconsciously followed it. The moment he got attracted by the voice was also the moment he opened the gate and went outside. It's like there was some kind of a mysterious force that took him over. The young man heedlessly made his way to the forest, followed the path he and his uncle had been on before that day. From afar, Shin saw a shadow moving around the spot where he and his uncle had buried the statue. She flew mid-air whilst emitting a green light, looking eerie. The woman then rushed to Shin. She stroked his face and slowly tempted him while the man was fondling her. The woman went to behind Shin. She grabbed him tightly, which made him unable to move. Then she sticked out her long tongue, which looked like that of a snake, and licked Shin by his neck. The woman later came out as a female demon. She bared her yellow sharp teeth and intended to bite him by the neck. At that moment, Shin was completely being controlled. Out of nowhere, a black dog showed up. It barked loudly, which frightened the two. The female ghost then disappeared into the pitch darkness of the forest, leaving him with utter confusion. Shin couldn't help but being scared as he recalled his nightmare. The aunt told him that it wasn't just a dream of his, it that actually happened in real life. And the fact that he was still here was because of her husband finding him out in the forest and bringing him home. Shin was astounded. He wondered who the female ghost was and why it went to him. The uncle was filled with horror, as he told Shin it was a female ghost in folk myth, one that had been staying inside the statue. Shin couldn't figure out why the ghost had targeted him, what exactly had happened to the woman before, and how did his uncle and his aunt know so much about her. The uncle then told Shin about the legend of the statue. Back when he was still a young kid in the village, there was this widow who was gorgeous, yet being a temptress. The woman always seduced men in the village as anyone went past her house would be tempted by her sweet words. Needless to say, all the men in the village were in love with her. They neglected their wives and families as some even gave all their properties to the young beautiful widow. Many women in the village held their grudge towards her as they believed she was the reason their families were breaking apart. One day they gathered in front of her house, yelling and smashing, while the gorgeous widow stayed in her house, hiding from them. As it struck midnight, they stealthily burned down her house. The fire broke out very fast, it swept through the small log house in just a blink of an eye. 
The woman together with the house had been burned to ashes. No one was responsible for the death of the woman as time went by. Things eventually became forgotten. One night there was this drunken man going home late as he looked warily. All of a sudden he saw a figure slowly approaching him. Its creepy shape quickly sobered him up. The man that got startled he collapsed on the ground. It was a woman who was horrifically burnt. There were only a few strands of hair to be seen on her head. She dilated her white eyes wide open her mouth as if she wanted to say something. Knowing it was the woman's spirit, the villagers later invited a shaman to send it away from the village, but it didn't work at all. The ghostly female still wandered around, scaring the villagers. What was even more terrifying, the ghost always stalked men who usually went outside at night, later became a horror to the villagers at that time. However, the ghost could be driven away with a black dog as it instantly backed away and disappeared if it saw one. Knowing the weakness of the female ghost, the villagers had taken in black dogs to protect their families from her. That was also the reason why there were so many black dogs in the village. Because of deep hatred, the widow's spirit had become a demon which always craved the vitality of men. Since she wanted to remain her beauty, the woman had turned herself into a statue which was uttered with a deadly curse that said any young man who found the statue would be haunted. Since then, the myths about the widow statue had been established. As the uncle finished his story, the sun had already come up. Shin felt a shiver as he listened to his uncle telling the story. The uncle didn't tell anyone about the incident since he didn't want the villagers to gossip about it. The old man later made a warning to his kids not to go near the spot where he buried the statue. This story took place in the poor countryside. One morning, on a big banyan tree in the middle of the village, hung a dangling dead body on a branch. People gathered around the body in curiosity. They were all there to listen in disbelief about the death of a young girl. Everyone said that the girl was murdered. Suddenly, at the end of the line, a man burst out and fell on his knees. He cried bitterly. Grief was evident on the elderly man's face. It had turned out that the corpse was his daughter. The man claimed that his daughter was killed by the devil lady, for he had seen branches of the white willow. The night before, as usual, the girl walked home alone after work. She had to cross a dark, empty street from work. But she was used to the road, so she did not want to bother her husband for a pickup. She walked home, exhausted from working overtime. Lost in thought, what appeared at the end of the road made her jump. In the darkness, she saw an old lady from afar. She guessed that this old woman was from the neighboring village. She probably had senile dementia and therefore got lost. Willing to help, she then approached to ask questions. As she got closer, <laughs> she had the chance to see the old woman clearly. Somehow, she just stood still by the tree. She spread her fingers apart and started counting them. She did not understand why she was so absorbed in her counting. She called out softly to her, but the old woman did not hear. The old lady was so focused that she did not realize she had been standing there for a while. She silently observed the strange behavior of this old woman. Suddenly, the old woman's face turned dark. Her body exuded a ghost-like mystery. Her voice trembled when counting the numbers 7 and 8. So much so, it gave anyone hearing goosebumps. Then, counting to 9, 
the expression on her face somehow changed. She looked sad and a little disappointed. She repeated the number nine dozens of times, making the girl look even more terrified. She softly asked what she was counting for and offered to take her home because it was late. It would be very dangerous for her to hang out alone here. When hearing the young girl's voice, the old woman looked up slightly. She looked at her with delight, as if she had just found a lost item. She looked at her for a long moment, then told herself the number 10 was right here. Then the odd lady looked down again, counting the numbers of fingers on her hand. But this time, she counted happily. On the number 10, she shouted out joyfully. Under the bright yellow light of the moon, the old woman's face appeared with pale skin and white eyes. Seeing this, the young girl screamed in horror. Now she was sure the old woman was not an ordinary person. She was terrified and fell on the ground. Her face began to sweat. She looked at the old woman with frightened eyes. The old woman, known as the Devil Lady, did not care about the girl. She continued to spread her hands out and counted her fingers over and over. This time she counted more slowly and stopped at number 10 with her pinky. After counting, she chuckled. Spreading her hands out in front of her, she exclaimed happily that she had found the number 10 that she had been looking for. The girl was still on the ground, trembling. The old lady turned her back and walked into the tree. Once she reached the tree, she glanced up at the girl and smiled happily. The woman's laughter echoed throughout the neighborhood, but no one heard it. Only the young girl felt a chill down her spine. The old woman then disappeared without a trace. The young girl leaned slightly to see which direction the old lady had headed, but strangely enough, she was gone. She stopped to sit up, looking for a way to get up quickly, but her feet were suddenly numb. When she finally stood up, she took a deep breath. She knew she had just encountered a demon. She turned and ran away. While running, she screamed loudly for help. However, that night, the surroundings were awfully creepy. Silence was all around her. On this bright, full moon night, the girl cried bitterly while running through the village. The next morning, people found her body hung on a large banyan tree in the middle of the village, where the old woman had once appeared. After hearing the story, the villagers could not hide their horror. It turned out that the legend of the Lady Devil was real. On every full moon, she reappears under the willow tree waiting for young girls. The story began in ancient times, when the Japanese fascists invaded and occupied the whole village. They were ruthless, plundering and killing people. Eager for women, they set a rule that took women and young girls from the village. One day, a beautiful girl who just turned 16 years old was forced by the villagers to be handed over to the Japanese. This poor girl, who showed extreme fear, kept looking around and calling for her mother. But her mother was also locked up by the villagers and nowhere to be found. Out of cowardice, the village youths mercilessly surrendered the poor girl to them. The lead commander looked at her body for a long time, then softly asked her to look up. The girl was begging, asking him to spare her life. But the more he heard her moan, the more he became delighted. He let out an evil laugh, and then he sent two soldiers to escort the girl to a hidden place to satisfy them. The villagers came together to see. Everyone heard the girl crying bitterly, but no one could help. After a while, 
there was no longer the sound of the girl screaming. Only a few sobs were left. Then there was the sound of gunshots. The most heartbroken person was her mother. She was desperate to know if her daughter had been killed by them. Missing children gradually became an obsession of the old mother. She kept asking for her girl back. Everyone was broken by the mother's situation. But because the enemies were too ferocious, no one dared to resist. Years went by and people saw her as a lost soul, wandering everywhere around the village. By then, she had become crazy, always asking for the return of her daughter. Then one day, she hanged herself on a large willow tree in the middle of the village. The same tree where the tenth young girl could be found hanging that morning. Her soul was deposited into the trunk of the big tree. She then casted a barbaric curse in order to take revenge on both the villagers and their descendants. Every full moon, she would hang young girls from the old tree stump as a warning to the old feud. On that same tree where dead people hung grew pure white willow flowers. And strangely enough, no one takes care of them, but the flowers are still blooming day by day very well. After the girl's story this morning, the whole village decided to burn down the big tree, hoping to find a way to save lives of the remaining girls in the village. The fire was burning in the night and the smoke emitted a strong stench. Maybe because the tree was old, or maybe, just maybe, because of the flesh and blood of the dead. After the tree burned off all its leaves, a white smoke came after, perhaps symbolizing the soul of the old mother. Years went by and no more girls were captured. Perhaps it was because the tree had burned down, or because the last girl that she had been looking for was found. This scary story revolves around a man named Kiba. For a long time Kiba never believed in ghosts, until one day when he ended up encountering one. Being haunted by the ghost, he decided to see a therapist to have his condition checked out. As the two had finally met, Kiba pointed at a black umbrella at a corner of the house to the therapist, then told him it was spooky. The young male therapist couldn't hide the curiosity on his face. He asked Kiba how the man could be scared by a small umbrella like that. Kiba breathed deeply. He lit a cigarette and then told the young man about an incident that happened to him a few days before. That day Kiba had an overnight trip. He had to drive through a rugged forest which was rumored to be haunted and mysterious. As he drove to the forest, all of a sudden he saw an old lady standing in the middle of the road blocking his way. Kiba couldn't hold his anger as he tilted the window and loudly held at her, but the woman didn't have a look of fear on her face. She chillingly turned around, looked Kiba in the eyes and asked if he had seen her daughter. The mysterious lady continued to bombard Kiba with questions, then hurriedly ran away leaving him totally confused. As Kiba finally composed himself, he continued with his shipment. As he made his way out of the forest, he stopped his truck by a grocery store. It was already morning. The store owner was very nice to him. He lit a cigarette for Kiba, then asked him about the trip. As they were chatting, Kiba saw a familiar figure from afar. It was the old lady who Kiba had previously encountered on the road. The shop owner said a tragic incident had caused the old woman to be mentally unstable. Kiba's curiosity was satisfied as he finally understood why she was acting bizarrely. Kiba then told the owner about their previous encounter. 
He even asked the man to tell him what had exactly happened to her. But the man's face instantly changed color. He extinguished his cigarette, refusing to tell Kiba the story. The man told Kiba to be extremely careful passing through the forest, then hurriedly got inside the store. As Kiba rarely had an overnight trip like this one, he decided to go sightseeing way until it was late at night, then began to go home. That night it was pouring with rain yet Kiba still cheerfully sang while driving his truck on the road. As Kiba nearly got out of the forest, he saw a woman holding a black umbrella walking in the rain. As he came closer to the woman, he realized she was carrying a baby that seemed to be sick. He stopped the car and asked them. It turned out that they were heading to the hospital. The woman asked Kiba if he could give them a lift to the place. Since Kiba was a kind person, he agreed to help them. Kiba opened the door for the two to get in. Then he gave them a towel to dry themselves off. Since Kiba was new here, he asked a woman to show him the way to the nearest hospital. The woman showed Kiba the way to the hospital. The car kept rolling on the road under the heavy rain. Thirty minutes later, they finally arrived at the hospital gate. Kiba instantly breathed a sigh of relief. He got out of the truck and opened the door for the two. The woman expressed her gratitude to Kiba then walked away. Tom wasn't in a hurry to leave soon as he stood there looking at the two until he no longer saw them. Later, Kiba got on his truck, only to find out that the woman had forgotten her black umbrella. As he stuck his head out of the window, hey! something bizarre immediately caught his attention. The woman was still there to be seen with her sickened son, but somehow they faded in and out of view. What was even more terrifying, as Kiba turned his gaze upon the hospital gate, he was startled to see a line that said, Hospital of the Dead, while the mother taking her son inside. Sensing something spooky was taking place, Kiba quickly drove away. But the man didn't think much about it as his only concern now was to return home as soon as possible. The parking lot was pretty far from his house since it was raining heavily. He had to use the black umbrella that was left in his truck. However, Kiba was a bit hesitant to take it as he remembered it was of the freaky woman and the son. The man wasn't sure if he would use it. A while later, Kiba finally made his decision as he took the umbrella to keep him from getting wet on his way home. Not knowing if it was the strong winds that affected the umbrella, Kiba was constantly being carried away by it. Not only that, while the man was making his way home, out of nowhere a block of wood suddenly fell from above. A loud noise was heard. Kiba could feel something hitting hard on the umbrella yet didn't do any damage to him as the object had bounced off. Kiba fell on the ground while the wood was being thrown to the side. And so was the umbrella. How lucky for Kiba, the umbrella had saved his life. It was a close shave for Kiba as he just got slightly injured arm. Kiba had a hunch that the woman had deliberately left her black umbrella in order for it to save his life. The man couldn't help but tremble as he recalled the nasty incident. The therapist was also filled with fear as he listened to Kiba's story. Kiba pulled on his cigarette then continued with his story. The next morning Kiba drove back to the grocery store. He intended to see the owner and ask him about the woman, as he believed the man must know something about her. Having no other choice, the shop owner had to reveal his secret to Kiba. It turned out that the woman and her son were actually spirits. Five years ago, on a stormy night, the woman was seen walking on the road holding her son. She asked people for a ride to the hospital, but no one stopped and helped her. Feeling helpless, the woman kept walking. Many cars were seen on the road, but no one bothered to stop and help them. There was even a vehicle driving into a muddy puddle and splashed dirty water on the two. The woman used her body to cover her child. However, she had unfortunately slipped and fallen down the cliff. The person who drove the vehicle instantly left the scene after witnessing the whole incident. 
The woman and the child died afterwards due to excessive bleeding as they hit their heads on rocks while falling down. The old lady, unable to bear with the excruciating pain of losing her daughter and grandson, became crazy shortly after that. Ever since the horrific accident, the villagers usually saw her holding a black umbrella speaking nonsense. And for the one who caused the accident, one day, as he drove past this area, he accidentally hit his car into a house. The man ended up being arrested, also had his involvement with the accident that took the lives of a woman and a child exposed. Those who went to the road in rainy days were likely to see a woman carrying her child while holding an umbrella. If a driver refused to give her a lift to her desired destination, she would mysteriously get into their car and scare them to death. And for that reason, no one dared to go to the forest at midnight. After telling Kiba everything he needed to know about the woman, the shop owner suggested him visiting their graves. Kiba then went to their graves. He returned the umbrella to them, then thanked them for saving his life. Thanks to his kindness, the spirits of the woman and the child had saved them from death. Since that day, Kiba always held a belief that ghosts actually existed in real life. This story is about Jiro's family, who just moved into a new house. The couple also had a lovely and obedient little daughter named Anna. While her mother was busy moving stuff, little Anna enjoyed jumping and running around. Then she opened the window to see what was outside. It seemed that the scenery outside did not disappoint Anna. A cool and gentle breeze blew in. It excited her, so she called her mother. Hearing her call, Yuki ran to her. The scenery behind was beautiful, just like what the family desired for so long. The pond behind the house refreshed the air. Jiro's family even planned to breed some fish in that pond. However, Anna was curious and asked her mother why no creature existed in that pond. Yuki couldn't really explain. She pulled Anna inside to help tidy things up in time for dinner. But it didn't stop there. An incident happened to their family on the first night in their new home. At midnight, Anna started twitching. She had a pale face and was sweating profusely. The little girl suddenly had a high fever. Seeing Anna's appearance, Yuri was extremely worried. Anna's condition became worse and worse. She began to tremble and breathe strenuously. Seeing this, Jiro and Yuri hurried to get a thick blanket to cover her body, but it didn't get any better. Yuri was so worried that she could not sit still. Looking at her child with such a high fever, it creeped her out. Suddenly, Anna woke up but her condition was still very bad. Not only that, she also seemed very panicked. Anna, after waking up, got into Yuri's lap and hugged her tight. Her small arms clutched her mother's shoulders fearfully. After a while, when she was more settled, Anna stammered out a few words. But Yuri didn't really know what her fear was. She then gently reassured her child's safety. The little girl was in her mother's arms, taking a deep breath and then pointed at the wall. According to Anna, she saw a man and a woman 
standing just next to the closet. Their faces were swollen and disfigured, as if they had been immersed in water for a long time. Their looks were terrifying. Jiro and Yuri looked towards the closet, but did not see a single figure. Anna was hallucinating, wasn't she? Although they could not see anything, both Jiro and his wife had a bad feeling about this. Feeling like something was wrong, Jiro then told his wife to take care of his daughter and he would go outside to get something. After saying this, Jiro rushed outside with some kind of plan. Just a few minutes later, he came back and in his hand was a large knife and a wooden cutting board. According to Jiro, when he was a child in the neighborhood, there were many children like Anna, who always said that they could see ghosts and the grandparents would use a large knife and a cutting board to make noise. This would drive away those souls every time. While making noise, Jiro also shouted loudly, asking the ghosts to leave his house and let go of their daughter. Yuri watched her husband's actions, hoping everything would be fine. Thinking that this new house had a problem, the next morning Yuri called her mother to help. Anna's grandmother saw her current condition and was also very surprised. However, before coming here, she also invited a feng shui master to help. The feng shui master looked around the house. He said the house currently had a strong miasmatic atmosphere and that the lake behind the house was the most serious problem. Anna's grandmother also told him in more detail about the two ghosts that Anna saw last night. Listening to the appearance of the ghosts soaked in water, his gut told him to ask everyone to go to the back of the lake. Arriving at the lake, they did not see what the master was looking at, but his face immediately went sharp, frowning and looking panicked. It seemed like he saw what Anna saw last night. On the pond surface now floated two extremely scary ghosts. Because he was used to seeing ghosts, the feng shui master could still remain calm. He just slowly turned his back and walked like nothing happened. Anna's grandma and Yuri saw the expression of the master and were very curious. But when they tried to ask, he just kept silent and said nothing. After coming back in the house, the master still refused to say a word, only carefully inspecting the wall next to the closet. Even the mold on the wall was very carefully examined by him. Jiro and Yuri also saw these stains when they moved in. Finally, after a long silence, the master said that he saw a man and a woman above the lake earlier. After listening, Yuri and her mother-in-law immediately panicked. They did not expect that about the water pond in the backyard. Also, they did not expect their long-time dream home to have such a terrifying secret. Not only did the two souls still live there, but they also wanted a child. And Anna was the one that the other two spirits were aiming for. According to the master, the only way to now help Anna is to get out of their sight. He advised them to make a paper dummy to deceive the two spirits. That night, following his instructions, Yuri bought a dummy that looked exactly like her daughter to the edge of the pond. First, she burned some votive papers. She silently pleaded to beg the two souls to liberate and spare her family. When the flame got bigger, Yuri threw the prepared paper dummy in. Then she began to beg, hoping that the two spirits would accept the child she had sent to them and let go of Anna. Yuri's request just stopped. The fire instantly grew louder, burning the dummy. It seemed the devotion of the mother had been accepted by the two souls. After doing exactly what the feng shui master told her, Yuri got up and went back to the house. The fire was still burning, but it was getting smaller. Beside the fire was water, and it suddenly moved in a vortex that grew bigger and bigger. Yuri could hear the water, but she just glanced without daring to turn back. On the pond surface were the two spirits, 
They were holding the hand of a little girl and walking away. In front of the window where the pond can be seen, now stood a mirror. And because of the mirror, Anna had not seen the two spirits again. A few days later, after hearing the news about Yuri's family, all the neighbors came over to visit. Just like what the feng shui master said, the two souls were a couple. But their families forbade they be together. So they committed suicide. There were many people who moved in here, but all of them had to move out within three days because of their harassment. To be sure, Yuri sewed a curtain placed in the window where the pond could be seen. And since then, nothing weird happened to their family anymore.